Recording in progress. Hello, uh, welcome to all. Um, uh, we're over here to discuss cryptocurrency. Can I be heard in Kuleleko? He can hear you clearly, Chair. <clears throat> okay, good. Then I welcome everybody. Uh, 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 and in particular, obviously, the PBO and National Treasury to talk to us about cryptocurrency and broader digital banking issues, but mainly, obviously, these technical issues that uh, the committee members at one stage felt, at some stage or the other, that we need more understanding of, not least those of us who have been around in the finance family since uh, 2014. So, um, are there any apologies uh, in Kululeko? Uh, the only apology I received was from Ms. Mamarekhane. She will be leaving the meeting um, halfway. She has another commitment. That's all, Chairperson. Okay, good. Let's get going. Who's here from PBO, Dr. Chanjis, are you here? Let's see. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, right. You and your team are here. Let's get going. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dumasani, can I suggest maximum, well, half an hour, but maximum 45, okay? Because there's right. yet another input. We don't like exceeding inputs that, well, we don't like inputs that exceed 50% of a sitting because it doesn't give enough time. Remember you'll have questions and you can slide in issues of slides that you haven't presented to us. You can just draw attention to not going through every line. And then if we have time at the end, we'll call both of you, yourselves and National Treasury back to give us further inputs for those things you didn't cover. Thank you. Over to you half an hour from now, I'm timing it. Thank you. Maximum 45 if it has to be. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Good afternoon, all members and colleagues in the platform. Um, and thank you once more from the committee for the opportunity for us to brief the committee in, in this regard. Uh, we will be briefing the committee together with uh, Mr. Simela and Pitello, Cipetello, Mr. Cipetello Simelani, um, and we'll try to stick to the time frames, Chairperson. I think the, the, the space that we, we, we're trying to give the briefing on, uh, will, it's continually de continuously developing but also given the need for the technology advancement, innovation, uh, and, and, and fin financial technology uh, having been one of the areas that have seen uh, the growth and innovation over the years, definitely is a very interesting space. But also uh, looking at the, the, the continuous rapid digitalization of economic activity, we like to see more happening in this area. So we will treat this as um, our initial input uh, and we'll come back later, as the chapter suggests. And to, you know, hopefully by the time we come back, there would have also been developments around the regulations and both domestically and internationally. Um, it's probably also, uh, you know, there's a lot of information in the public domain, and a lot of hype around the cryptocurrency. Uh, and, and, and even during our time when we present, preparing this presentation, we have to navigate through around a lot of, lot of, lot of issues there. Sipetel is moving the slides for me and then uh, some team members also in the platform. Um, look, the presentation, Chair, Pastor, this is a presentation outline. Um, next slide, Spatello. Um, the, the presentation really uh, presents some of the inter introductory, it's meant to really give some introductory background on cryptocurrencies and also try to look at some of the South African development stance, development stance with regards to regulatory framework and some of the issues that are coming in with regards to cryptocurrency. And also share some of the international trends and experiences and developments around cryptocurrency. Uh, but also looking at the the the, uh, the 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 development around the regulatory framework in this regard. The brief is based on the desktop research. Uh, you know, use information from various professional bodies, including my professional body, and keeping abreast really with some of the development that's been happening around virtual currency for the year. So. We're hoping that it provides that introductory background and provide stimulating engagement among the members. Also, try to respond to the discussion as the committees have been having over the years, over the months around cryptocurrency. Uh, introduction slide. I think you know 
uh, cryptocurrency is a form of, of, of uh, digital money. Although it is not in the mainstream, it's not a mainstream currency that is not recognized like government back, backed currencies, um, you know, domestically and globally. There has obviously been a, a, a public debate uh, hyped around this uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and how it's developing as a lot of interests are coming in. But also there, there has been an uh, argument around the benefit of using cryptocurrency instead of the, the government backed currencies as both in assets for investment, but also as a means of uh, medium of exchange. Uh, but also, we've also seen some times we've seen uh, serious criticism leveled against cryptocurrencies for uh, its uh, high volatility in its value uh, and lack of regulatory or measures to, to uh, you know, oversee that uh, by governments. Uh, as these concerns, many argue they, they could threaten the, the viability of an asset, of crypto assets in the, in the market but also an uh, issue of protecting the, the, the players in the market. Since the cryptocurrencies uh, is not a mainstream currency, they, 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 use, they use highly sophisticated types of uh, technologies which try to provide security, which would have been otherwise been security and governments, which would have, would have been otherwise provided by governments or, or you know, like in you know, a mainstream currencies in the regard. Uh, and also it can create itself you know, that also system also allows for creation of further currencies or further coins, uh, or also further making of these coins over, over, over the, the, the agreements and, and so on. It creates trust in the system, the, the sophistication, the technology behind it creates trust in the system, uh, you know, and that also, that in a way of credit trust creates value within the cryptos as an asset for investments for many players who've been playing in this space. Um, we have seen popularity, as I said earlier on, as one of the commentators recently has said, you know, cryptocurrency market is, should be seen more like a community. It's like a community in which, you know, members of the community trust each other uh, over time and they know each other. Uh, and, and there is some way of trying to identify each other in the market where new members are continually, continually being welcomed to the family and to community. And but also uh, try to keep that trust going on which is one of the major factors that uh, you know, the community argues what keeps the, the cryptocurrency market uh, going in this regard. We've seen, also seen a growing trust from retail investors and other institutional players. Uh, and this really has continued to put more pressure into regulatory bodies to really become innovative in addressing the risk imposed by the, the, this community within the entire society as a whole, if I use that and make of the community. Uh, the current cryptocurrencies are enabled by technologies I mentioned. Uh, uh, one of the major technologies, uh, you know, um, a blockchain technology, Nestle's Petal, uh, the blockchain technology, which is a really a digital infrastructure, which in a way, you know, it becomes a database from which it enables the, the digital currency to function and, and, and ensure that there is better security uh, like said, as I said earlier on, which would have been a normal mainstream would have been provided by regulatory framework in, in that regard. And, and of course, the blockchain also known as digital ledger, which allows uh, you know, various players with certain security measures to access, to trade, to participate in the space of digital, digital uh, um, uh, uh, currency. And certainly the, the, the infrastructure is enabled, it's, it's intended to really need, eliminate the data uh, tempering and create trust within the, 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 the data that is presented uh, from the system. You know, when you put out the, the value of it, you know, it's within that system that allows uh, the, the authenticity and, and trust within that information from the, from the ledger. It is this reason that uh, the cryptocurrency does, you know, the players, the system argues that there's no need for a third party central bank's authority to make it function. You know, there's no need as, as blockchain plays that role without limited and tempering, as they say. But also, uh, look, I think the technology itself, the blockchain technology has been in use uh, over the years, uh, even before, way before the invention of the cryptocurrency, as early as in the early 90s, where uh, the, the scholars, I think it's Harbour and, and Stonet, who wanted to implement a system where the document, that, uh, the document temp stamps could not be tempered with, you know, so that was one of the way of ensuring that the documents are, are secured. And, and those are some of the other users that have been uh, relied to uh, be using the, uh, the blockchain, which is now being used within the crypto, cryptocurrency. Next slide, Spatello. I think 
uh, chair, president, and honor members and colleagues. Uh, it is shown in the literature that the idea of the virtual coin, you know, um, was was noted quite even earlier, you know, earlier in the, in the early 80s, how, um, you know, the issue of virtual coins has been written about in the literature. However, the, the idea of the cryptocurrency was invented later in the, in the, in the I think in the, the late 90s, you know, the, thinking about it and, and, and been written about a lot, but the actual creation of the, the, the currency itself, the coin, as, as it's called by different names, it's linked largely to the post-2008 global financial crisis era, which is uh, inarguably one of the one way by those who advocate for, 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 for those who are worried about the collapse of the financial system, that they should, uh, there's a need for an alternative systems, financial system that is decentralized from government-backed uh, systems in, in that regard. Then we saw more cryptocurrencies coming to the market, more uh, currencies with the Bitcoin being one of the major, one of the first publicly uh, used virtual currency. And, and, and it has gained a lot of attractions, and that's one of the, the, the virtual currency that's been making a lot of the rounds in the public domain. Uh, and we've later seen the, uh, the initial offering also come into the, into the space, which is an, a, a new virtual currency created within the blockchain itself sometime. The, the blockchain has to be, the, the currency has to be issued, but now the, the initial coin offering, it's more of a creating uh, the virtual currency within the blockchain itself, which creates, created by offering or selling the currencies uh, until they generate value and develop to an asset in, in that regard. And subsequently, we've seen also uh, the stable coin, uh, you know, been, been, you know, been created and issued within the, the market, which in a, in a, in a main, um, you know, it's allegedly tried to have a, I mean, the bigger question, which we'll come to just in the next slide, about how to create value of the, of the virtual currency. It's, it's, you know, stable coins are created in a way by being packed with other uh, mainstream uh, assets or securities, like maybe it's packed with the uh, 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 currency or packed against um, a tradable community, like whatever, uh, which is in the mainstream. And, and it, you know, created a coin but as that value of the let's say US dollar moves, the, the value of the of, of, of the that particular stable coin also moves. You see that coming into this picture as well. And then we've seen 2017 when the, the market worth of the cryptocurrency, particular Bitcoin, which is picked in 2017, which later uh you know raised some panic uh, uh and, and and you know later the value crashed down the precise that which will be the discussion in the next slide. Um and, and I think that the, when you look at the history and the trend within this development, there you will see that it's clear that over the years and on the, this trend, the market has continued to look for more secure assets. You know, I mean, try to move away from the mainstream system, but try to have these assets, but more try to create security as you see more currencies, more uh, innovation coming into the space to try to get more secure assets in over 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 the time. Um, next slide, uh, Spetelo. I think this slide really uh it's a recent snapshot of the virtual currency various uh you know virtual currencies and and cryptocurrencies to show that bitcoin is still one of the largest um and 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 it's been developing over the years and there's so many of them uh, some have been discontinued some continue to be generated over the time uh, in this regard next slide um i think the, this slide chairperson i think the, the biggest question uh you know because points for every investment or for, for, for every pocket of assets, often about creating value for the investor, for, for the user. And it has been a big issue as well within the, the, the cryptocurrency, you know, valuation is a big issue. And, and uh, that, uh, you, know, you know, particularly because cryptocurrencies are not backed by government um, and, and, you know, it is, you know, so, it is quite difficult to draw some particular market assumptions about its valuation like other mainstream assets or uh, uh, instruments in the market. Hence, now, you know, it classified as not having to fail because it's very difficult to say these are assumptions that you can assume that's how the value created because of how different factors play in, in creating value compared to your conventional mainstream of, of valuing an asset in, in terms of how we've been doing it at the time. And, and, and really lacking the, the, the intrinsic value it's, it's, and other some of these factors really place cryptocurrency as a high risks or susceptible to high volatility or value is, is reloaded or gained with 
it's a short period of time we've seen over the past weeks, months, you know, there's been quite a uh, hype and playing showing that how much the, the cryptocurrency can, can, can be volatile. Without that some of these conventional financial market assumptions that are placed on these assets. Cryptocurrency gain value based on scale of community involvement, as I mentioned earlier, but also issues, the issue here is around how much community members trust each other, plays a role. Uh, other effects affecting cryptocurrency value stem from the, the, the image of players, how they portray the corporations that are uh, managing these infrastructures or playing in the space. In order to maintain its value, it has to be usable within the, the, the once it's created, it has to be usable, it has to be usable in, in the system so that it to get more uh, traded in and it creates value. And, and there is also, as I mentioned, a stable coin, which, like, as I said earlier on, stable coin is largely trying to create value by pegging its value against a, a particular uh, trade, uh, mainstream uh, assets, you know, like as I made an example there, uh, about the, the US dollar or whatever currency it would be. So, the, so in a sense, um, the, the biggest debate, you know, it's around how do we ensure that the value of the cryptocurrencies are clearly, you know, understood how it's created and, and there's a normal, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what normal would be, but there's a particularly trend that you can follow in say this how really it's created. It's a very, very big issue as we've seen over, over the years, over the, the days, months, and, and, and so on. Next slide, Spatello. I think the, the, despite the issues around valuation, there are those uh, the players, uh, and, and including some of the jurisdictions, uh, the countries who continue to advocate for use of cryptocurrency, we'll show you later in the, towards the end of the presentation, uh, for various reasons, of course, some bad, good reasons, but there are those who still see it as a, one of the uh, uh, innovation in financial technology, which could be the next frontier in, 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 in assets and so on. Um, they argue for some of you know the, that the the ease of recognition that technology advances could be in, in, in used to enhance efficiency markets, uh, whatever other it is. And these are some of the reasons that when you look at and listen to the literature, look at how the users and some of those cases list some of the key uh, uh, benefit of having cryptocurrencies. They say the risk manipulation. I mentioned earlier on that the creation of the actual uh, uh, Bitcoin will realize that it picked up. Just post the, the, the 2008 global financial crisis, which some of you know argues that okay, so we try to uh, remove manipulation in the system, eliminate the some of those uh, uh, set you know um, um, inefficiencies in the system. Uh, I mean, you know, cutting middlemen. I don't know how that you know, but those are those arguments that cutting the middlemen. Even though when you look at the infrastructure itself, there is a middleman you know sitting somewhere trying to verify or uh, which also they will talk about the cost associated to that later this regard. Uh, there's the argument around uh, banking the unbanked, um, you know, those can access financial services that can be used as that. But also um, decentralizing the system itself, uh, you know, as a one way of trying to ensure that, uh, you know, everybody can have access to that. Uh, you know, there's better returns, others argue, uh, and the, the capital appreciation is far much always your conventional, which in a way could be seen as a risk as well on the other side, because it's not sustainable to such an extent if you've seen how it, it operates. Um, some of the myths, some argues that some of the myths are going around about cryptocurrencies, that it's criminal, uh, even though you've seen a lot of light ups about uh, illicit and uh, corrupt crimes, uh, globally they've used, cited uh, the use of cryptocurrencies area where criminals are able to hide it, but some, some Users argue that it's a myth uh, to some extent. Um, you know that uh, you can only, you can make anonymous transactions uh, anonymous transactions for all cryptocurrencies, which is untrue. Uh, only blockchain uh, uses Bitcoin, which is also untrue. Various uh, uh, currencies can play there, and these are some of the myths. And and uh, over the above and that, you know, go to the next slide, um, which you know with the benefits comes the risks attached to it. And, and over the recent past weeks, months, we've seen huge hype, panic uh, in the cryptocurrency market within, with this value uh, being so ever volatile, particularly look at the Bitcoin. And many communities argue that the hype and panic are certain to some extent to respond to other factors that suggest their like trust in the system, but also issues around uh, uh, certain members of the community, the citizens community, Having much influence over, over, over others, and but also the lack of trust. You know, there isn't government playing in space. How do you, 
you know, how do we go about? But again, it goes back to the issue of the federation slide to say, how do we have a consistent way which would be an intrinsic assumptions about the federation in that? And hence, we've seen so many risks been highlighted there that the lack of a regulatory framework means government are unable to protect the, the players in the game, lack of insight. Uh, of course, the hype itself can create a bit of a, 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 a you know, a challenge that we get excited about it and later on without putting the money, investing without really knowing what they put their money in and later losing out quite a lot sharply if you try to make a short investment and, and so on, you know. Uh, but also the issue of scamming of potential investors because now it uses technology and, and we know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, the players in there who are there largely to scam. There's a lot of cases where, particularly around uh, initial coin offering where a lot of companies were charged or the players were charged for scamming uh, potential investment in the area. High volatility in the current itself essentially risks in an expected movement market. And, and really, it becomes difficult to say you've got this valuation of assets. Uh, and so, more so that when you see that some institutional investors are playing in the space, uh, which certainly uh, raise some of this, this risk. Next slide, Spatello. Uh, Cryptocurrencies have a risk of not being able to sell liquidated. And, and can you know you know quickly at reasonable price and, and so on. So you know the asset becomes an asset when you can benefit from it. You know, and and if it's not going to be able to do that and it becomes not an asset any longer. And some of these kept kind of like some of them actually created and disappeared in the market. Um, and that becomes also a risk of consideration if if you know the society or the players perhaps oversight for a regulatory environment to take that into account. And there's also been another reporting, uh, precisely because there isn't very uh, international or jurisdicts, many jurisdicts having specific uh, regulatory framework which deals with the cryptocurrency. You find that in many senses, uh, um, uh, deliberately and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, by lack of guidance, being under reporting, which later could lead to a lot of, um, you know, punitive measures from regulatory bodies in, in that regard. Some of the key risks, really, that. You know, when you look at the literature, I highlighted this risk within this uh, within this space of cryptocurrency space. We thought uh, next slide. You know, we thought also that maybe, given that we try to really you know start what appetite in the discussion around this, should probably the slide that also shows a typical transaction how it goes in in a, in, a, in a when you have a buyer potential buyer using cryptocurrency. You know they. Would, have to submit that, and then the, the seller or the cashier before they accept that, they would first have to verify whether this uh, uh, currency has value and how much it has. And they have um, this, they go to the system structures that mentioned here on the players, the nodes in the system play check, check, and they verify whether the, the, uh, the, the buyer indeed has coins that they can afford to buy a product. And once they are done, they send the, the cashier the confirmation. And, and thumbs up the cashier sell and so on. But of course, it's more complicated than we simplify it. But of course, the slide tried to really take it more in a more simplistic way to say, look, uh, this is how many of the users see it, it, it being useful in, in, in this regard. Um, of course, I'll skip the next few slides, Patello, because they just provide more substantive details of how the transaction work. Um, go to this slide, yes. I think, as I, as I no, no, the previous slides, Patello. Apart from cryptocurrencies being issued, uh, you know, the market, other cryptocurrencies are created within the blockchain itself. And initial uh, coin offerings, one of those uh, uh, cryptocurrencies which are issued, which, which is similar to the initial public offering where a private company issue shares publicly the first time. And cryptocurrency can also be created in that way, whereby uh, IEC, which is a new virtual created within the blockchain, which is created by offering or selling. The currency until it gets create generates value and develop into an assets as well. Uh, you know, like like your um, other cryptos has uh, IOC has to be traded for them to exist or for them to gain value within the system. And and if it doesn't get traded in, it loses value uh, and it can disappear as well. And the initial investors might have lost the, the investment in the area. And there's been a very also, area where we've seen a lot of losses. Uh, there is, I lost yesterday, two days ago, I saw a court case where some of the companies were actually, I think the US, one of the countries, I forgot, where there was a court case where, um, you know, 
the investors has lost money here, but without having understood what they, they, they're investing in and so on. So this slide just, just gives you a sense of what other, how this uh, other uh, um, cryptocurrency like, you know, initial coin offering are created in the system and how they gain value. Um, next slide, Spetelo. Uh, there are two most common blockchain-based digital assets or currencies, which is the, the digital currency coin or the token. And, and uh, the main difference between the two is that the cryptocurrency coin have their own blockchains, whereas the crypto coins are built on existing blockchains and each has its own pros and cons as we try to list those. And of course, um, with the, 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 the token reliant on a particular, uh, um, I mean the coin, sorry, the coin is digital currency similar to the fiscal currency and operates on its own blockchain, its own protocol, and, and the coins are used as a source of payment. These are examples. The token largely is dependent on a particular project, a particular already existing blockchain. And of course, when you're investing or when you uh, uh, play in space or frankly, when you create regulation, you probably need to understand for which platform are you creating regulation or oversight mechanism in that regard. Uh, next slide, Spatello. I think I'm moving quite quickly at the same time there. In order to trade uh, on the cryptocurrency, the traders uh, uses a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, so cryptocurrency exchange is more like a, it's like a market, you know, where we, there's an online market where, uh, you know, potential investors can buy and sell crypto, 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 cryptocurrency, um, you know, and, and every exchange has its unique rules, but they all provide access to most prevalent cryptocurrencies. And I think what we show in the, in the slides, uh, uh, there can be centralized exchanges where you've got a one particular entity which facilitates the processes of procuring, investing in cryptocurrencies, or they can be decentralized where, uh, you know, decentralized exchange, you know, there's multiple players in the space who, uh, you know, participating within the blockchain itself, uh, you know, where, you know, can purchase or invest in the cryptocurrency. In, in a centralized exchange, you have trust, you have to trust a third party to monitor transactions, secure assets, and be able to buy or seller. The, 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 the deals are not tracked uh, on the blockchain and buyers and sellers is required to submit the yeah, personal information, corporate information, depending on who will be investing. And on the other hand, so the centralized does not have a third party on which you can rely on. Um, and it's more obviously, uh, you know, all the funds and the exchange uh, remain stored within the blockchain itself. They participate in the mining itself, itself and try to, uh, and in this platform, we allow peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading in, 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 in this regard. And I think what you're trying to show that uh, in the next slide, uh, some of the pros and cons on which exchange uh, are used um, in, 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 in trading in cryptocurrency. Uh, we look at the centralized, the governance around a centralized uh, uh, a platform, uh, you know, central cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a single one entity that can provide, uh, uh, you know, activities or facilitate the transaction on behalf of the buyer and seller. And the other one, uh, you have various entities participating in the blockchain instead of doing their own. Of course, it depends on really who is. Uh, I've seen actually a lot of people are, are, are relying heavily on centralized blockchain. And of course, in many senses, in this line, centralized more of your institutional uh, investment. But of course, anybody can play in this space. And also, security wise, um, this, the, the centralized information and, and, and the confidentiality data is taught. The central, central hub, which can be good, bad, depending on how you can look at Think about the cyber attacks, information could easily be, be, be taken away or be lost. And, and on the decentralized blockchain network, it means the single point of failures and decreases by decentralized whole thing within the peer to peer, -to -peer network in there. Uh, infrastructure, more infrastructure will be required for, for decentralized uh, compared to the, the centralized one, which is one entity. Um, and of course, you know, centralized being a middleman, the other one not being a middleman. I think that the point of showing this is just to try to uh, show different uh, areas where the 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 the, 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 the cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency market operates and and some of the advantage of having different uh, uh, exchanges and in, in this regard, I think Chairperson, I'll I'll give Mr. Simelan to take us through some of these mechanisms. Uh, and I'll come back later. Thank you so much, Sipatello. 
Okay. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, members. Um, uh, I'll be touching on issues around accounting for cryptocurrency, reporting challenges around cryptocurrency, and the policy development also that is around cryptocurrency. Um, that is my way. My slide just stopped moving. Um, okay, cool. <clears throat> um, as we may well be aware that cryptographic assets have generated a significant amount of interest recently, given their repeat increase in the value and volatility. Um, as many activity in the cryptographic asset has increased, it has also um, attracted a regulatory a scrutiny across in many different jurisdictions. However, since there is no accounting standard that specifically address the cryptocurrency, one must look into the existing international financial reporting standard and apply the principle-based approach on, on that one. So there are many questions that um, currently being debated or shared views um, on how to apply the international financial reporting standard. The issue at hand currently is how to recognize or how to measure and close, disclose the activities associated with the issuance of the cryptocurrency, investment in cryptocurrency, as well as various types of cryptocurrency assets. There are countries that have taken a stance or have classified cryptocurrency as a legal tender, e.g. in Japan or in Sweden, where they recognize it as a, a legal currency. Also, in countries like Australia, they've recognized it as a, as a property. So there are different countries that have made the stance around the classification of the cryptocurrency and reporting. But South Africa, there is no specific laws or regulation that addresses the use of cryptocurrency. Um, so cryptocurrency is in nature is designed as a medium of exchange. The, it represents a specific amount of digital resource which the entity has the right to control whose control can be assigned to a dead party. Maybe just elaborating on issues uh, that I've touched on the previous slide, we will just take the cryptocurrency and put it against a numerous or various types of um, international accounting standard to see if it meets those definition, uh, it meets those standards in order to be recognized or it can be taken into account uh, or how it can be accounted. So the next few slides, um, I'll be touching based on those um, issues. <clears throat> For an example, the first one, if we were to define cryptocurrency as an asset, the definition of an asset, uh, it says the present economic resource. Um, so cryptocurrency are a digital representation, representation of a value. Or in an asset, we expect a future economic benefit um, so cryptocurrency have a value in exchange or value in use and assets are controlled by an entity or by a holder. So in this case, holder of a private key that owns a cryptocurrency or depending on the contractor arrangement. So it also meets those criterion. And lastly, assets need to arise from the past transaction. So in this case, the cryptocurrency could have been arising from the previous uh, blockchain transaction. So maybe just putting it, um, I'm not gonna read all the IAS standard, but I'm just gonna touch on a few. For an example, if we were to say cryptocurrency is a cash and cash equivalent, that is IAS uh, seven. So it, since it represents the medium of exchange, one may classify it as, um, as an asset. However, it is not supported by the central banks and it is not a legal tender in most jurisdictions. So it does not uh, qualify to be called as a cash and cash equivalent. Um, uh, maybe also, if we were to classify it as an intangible asset, what, what is intangible asset? What's the definition of intangible assets? So cryptocurrency are identifiable non-monetary assets without physical substance, and it satisfies the definition of the intangible assets. So the definition of intangible assets is that they must be identifiable, separable, and it must be arising from the contractual or uh, the legal right. <clears throat> 
Uh, maybe just to make some concluding remarks on accounting for um, cryptocurrency. There are so much uh, judgment and uncertainty that are involved in the recognition and measurement of the cryptocurrency. And certain amount of disclosure is... Okay. And certain amount of disclosure is required to inform users in their economic decision making. So the International Accounting Standards Section 1, it requires that an entity must disclose the judgment that it has used in its management regarding the accounting for the assets. And accounting for cryptocurrency is not as simple as it may appear, since there is no international financial reporting standard that applies to it. And um, reference must be made in the existing current financial standard in order to, to account for the cryptocurrency. So the, the, the next section, I'll be just touching on the stance, uh, South African stance on the cryptocurrency and also the taxation um, um, on cryptocurrency. Um, the position of South Africa, uh, South African government um, is that uh, in 2014, the South African government or the South African Reserve Bank issued a position paper on virtual currency. The position paper expressly stated that the South African Reserve Bank uh, may issue a legal tender and that the decentralization of the convertible virtual currency are not a legal tender in South Africa. So central bank is the only one that have the sole right to issue a legal tender. So this means that merchant uh, um, retailers or retailers may refuse to accept virtual currency as a means of payment. And South African Reserve Bank has also warned uh, public about the risk, various risks associated with the use of the virtual currency. And in 2016, the Intergovernmental FinTech Working Group was also established. The aim was to develop a common understanding amongst the regulation and policymakers of the financial technology development, as well as the regulatory policy implication in the financial sector and in the economy. So this is just a timeline of the stance of the, the, the South African government when it comes to cryptocurrency. And lastly, is uh, in 20. 20 last year, the, the, the working group um, also released a position paper on crypto assets. Um, um, and it also suggested some regulator approaches on how to, 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 to move going forward with regard to the cryptocurrency. So the revised policy and regulator position on, on, on this uh, cryptocurrency, they, they, they made some policy position and also some recommendation, for instance, uh, on buying and selling cryptocurrency by consumers. They said it should be under a twin peak system where there will be a prudential, a prudential regulator and also a con market conduct regulator. Or when it comes to payment using cryptocurrency, the ability to make payment using cryptocurrency is currently not provided under the existing regulatory framework. So these were some of the policy position and some of the recommendations that were made by uh, the positioning paper that was released by the working group um, in 2020. Um, um, so maybe one can ask a question, can I buy a property using a currency? <clears throat> um, the, the, the answer, the short answer would be yes, it, it is legally possible. Um, I think I've skipped this slide. Okay, sorry, I've just skipped the slide. So the initial transaction of using the cryptocurrency was back in 2010. And today cryptocurrency is widely accepted in the variety of countries, African countries, such as in Morocco, Nigeria, even in South Africa. It is, um, there are people who are using cryptocurrency or there are retailers that are accepting cryptocurrency as a means of payment, even though the South African Reserve Bank position around uh, cryptocurrency is that they are the only one that uh, can issue a legal tender. So cryptocurrency are increasingly being accepted in the retail sector as Bitcoin becomes a bigger part of our payment ecosystem. There are a number of retailers that have accepted um, the cryptocurrency as the means of payment. So that the, if there are transactions that are taking place, that begs the question of how the taxmen uh, get its juice or how the tax regulators apply to the 
um, to these transactions that are taking place using the cryptocurrency. <clears throat> um, so this was just an example. Can I buy a house using a cryptocurrency? The short answer was that it's yes. You can buy a immovable property using cryptocurrency. Uh, you can agree to pay using uh, the means or you can, using the cryptocurrency, which is not physically in nature. <clears throat> but um, there are risks associated with using cryptocurrency in purchasing uh, that type of a property. For an example, um, is that the money is held, okay, is that using cryptocurrency, you remove the usual means of securing the transaction. In this case, the money is held in the trust by transferring at attorney pending the transfer of the property. So in that case, using cryptocurrency, you lose that right. And also the guarantee against such fund cannot be issued since it is digital, it's not physical money. Um, <clears throat> so cryptocurrency are either considered as capital or income when it uh, received or when it's accrued or when it's deposited. So, um, for an example, if it's a, we take an example of a Bitcoin, there are three distinct transactions throughout the Bitcoin life cycle. One, the acquisition of Bitcoin is through mining and the receipt of Bitcoin in exchange for goods and services and the exchange of Bitcoin largely um, tender. So moving forward. Um, so South African um, Revenue Service issued a statement in 2018 where they reflected that um, in South Africa, the weight currency is not defined in the income tax and the cryptocurrency are neither official South African tender, nor they are widely used as accepted in South Africa as a medium of payment. So <clears throat> moving forward, Okay, so um, just maybe just to summarize the, 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 the stance when it comes to taxation, the South African Re Revenue Service indicated that in 2017, it was in discussion with the top, te te top technology companies in the world regarding the method to track the cryptocurrency trade more efficiently. And the SARS announced it will continue to apply the normal income tax rules to cryptocurrency and it will expect affected taxpayers to declare their cryptocurrency gains or losses as part of their taxable income. So cryptocurrency, since cryptocurrency transactions are subjected to general principles of South African tax laws, depending on whether cryptocurrency is held on revenue or capital account, the income tax or the capital gain uh, tax calculation in respect to cryptocurrency transaction will be the same for any other revenue or capital gain transaction that will be calculated. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Dumsan who will just finish up uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you, Secretary. Well, Sonny, can you be very quick, Dumsani, yes, please, I really? Think, yes, because, you know, we keep reminding participants, and you know me for thousands of years, it's very easy for intellectuals like you to pitch yourself to fit into the requirements. You know, it's 45 minutes. Like, if you, uh, you know, person making a public hearing who's not used to us, uh, that's okay. But really, Dumasani, please, can you just round up in three minutes? What I also want to say, speaking for myself, and I am the chair for what it's worth for now, it's, you know, it's very helpful, but it's a bit too sophisticated for me. The terms that I use are not explained. Uh, you know, like I thought it's like a educational thing telling us what exactly is is blockchain and so on but hopefully between the two of you when you come to question time you will simplify it so can you please rush through this because i think it's too sophisticated for the chair anyway i can't speak for others i would imagine those who have come from municipal councils also without patronizing them are having problems but i can tell you now i'm finding this thing very interesting but it's a bit too sophisticated for me you know if, if, if in your in your pbo maybe you know, at your level, I'm sure you understand these things. At my level, I don't. I think of myself. I, I, I presume that, you know, I can't speak for others. I'm just surmising. Maybe they know more than me. If I'm the only one having a problem with the highly technical nature of the input, 
then okay, I'll have to learn on my own. But we have your submission anyway. Dumasani, I'm giving you three minutes, really. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chairperson. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think uh, there are a lot of technical, high tech. I think, um, well, as I said earlier, it's going to be the first time we'll keep on talking some of the issues. And there were quite a lot of information put into this. Uh, so we had to choose which we put in. But we'll certainly be available to continue uh you know supporting the committees in this regard but i think just a few things i would really wrap up in three five minutes time i think this slides in, in the chair we're trying to show you that um there has been a lot of discussion really internationally about a regulatory environment around cryptocurrencies uh even the eu parliament i think they discussed it over the past three years but i think the main worry comes out often the the issue of around anonymity in the use of the cryptocurrency big issue particularly when you look at the crimes financial crimes and money laundering and other issues create a bit of a problem. But I think what I've, the report I looked at uh, two weeks ago, it shows that even despite these concerns, a lot of push for it to be recognized and, 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 and you know, recognize that it can create uh, a space for, for investment, even though it's recognized as a, a very risky space to operate, particularly when you have more, you don't have, you know, the regular environment that protects those who don't have more information about this space. Uh, so that's what it says. And it was also seen in some of the, I think the US earlier in the year introduced a bill, tried to uh, propose a regulatory environment, particularly related to big, big um, stable coins, which are uh, currencies that are pegged against the US dollar and other related uh, tradable commodities. I think this slide, Chairperson and all our members, tries to break down countries that we've looked at into four, four, four categories. One category being the countries that are completely banned the cryptocurrencies of bit, uh, bit of, uh, cryptocurrency. The second column being uh, those who are indirectly, even though not directly banning it, but indirectly the activities showing that they are not open to cryptocurrencies. But also on the other side, we have um, uh, 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 others who have actually other restrictions who see and the, the actual potential in cryptocurrency. In, as an issue, in addition to the financial their markets and, and also those who want, who have already initiated a process of uh, developing their own uh, government backed cryptocurrency. So, certainly a lot of developing this area. So, those are the countries on the extreme right there. The first one being the key ones that have banned it. Um, I think at the, at the end of the day, what is all comes to check is in, I mean, the, the point on, on, on trying to emphasize the, is that the experiences both in the literature and both in practice. Is that uh, 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 there, there can never be a wholly competitive, privately run mental systems that ensure stability in the financial system. So there need to be an element of regulatory. Cryptocurrencies are obviously benefiting from the publicly dominated mental systems, fiscal systems. So there need to be some sense of protecting the, the public or having mechanisms to oversee that. Due to high, it's high volatility and continued valuation difficulties. And as uh, cryptocurrency becomes wide, wide, widespread and mainstream, with regul um, without regulatory environment oversight, this poses risks to the system. The continued use of cryptocurrency for speculatory purposes lead to some of the similar risks in the system if, if, if there isn't a mechanism to oversee that. But I think uh, the recent developments in the US and the EU is that they don't see high risks as, as some are saying they are high risks to the system. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the cryptocurrency transaction costs also may be underst uh, understated uh, and we look at some of the uh, sophistications around the transactions, but also there's been a huge call around the, the use of energy in mining of the cryptocurrencies and how does that really bode well with the, 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 the concerns around the renewable um, economies and all of that. And then lastly, I think the point we want to emphasize at the bottom there is that government stance on regulatory, or re on, on regulatory framework and cryptocurrencies has to really address the microeconomic implications of, of, of the, 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 the system uh, and functionality of the mental system and banking and as a whole system. And, and when it, the are consideration, those are need to be taken into account. Jefferson, I think we'll stop here, but I think what I want to emphasize is that we will uh, certainly come back and provide more detail. I agree with you, we would have wished to provide specific definitions on some of these mechanisms, but there was quite a lot to cover with you. Uh, but I will come back again, Jeff. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, PBO, Dumasani, and Mr. Similane, whom I don't recall appearing before our committee before, but maybe is he a new member? 
he has been around uh, for, for for a while. He, he does participate in accreditation. He's been around for more than three years now. He does but, as, yeah, but has he made a submission before our committee before? Uh, as part of the team, not in uh, alone. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, welcome, yeah. Mr. Similani. So let me thank you on behalf of the committee. It's a good input, but um, as I said, can Treasury help you as well? And maybe we need to bring an academic in who can explain things a bit simpler. Uh, we, need, we need a simple explanation, Treasury. I mean, you know, for example, you see, let me be frank. I, I Dumasani, uh, and Treasury, you know, I, I used to go to those parliamentary network on the World Bank meetings, as I still do virtually. But uh, uh, I learned about this because I was there. And it's not fair to others who haven't had an opportunity, but there they don't explain the concepts to you. They speak at your level, Dumasani, very sophisticated. And then I had to run around while they were talking to look onto what, what does cryptocurrency actually mean? What is blockchain? What is all these things? What are all these things? And where's the world going? And so on. Now, we, we are moving into this digital e-commerce, digital banking e-commerce era and so on. And people have got, you know, cell phones without bank accounts and they can send money from, you know, from, from, from one cell phone to another. I had helped somebody over the weekend uh, to do that who couldn't believe that she could do it. Uh, I have been sending money to people a lot recently through NetBank's Imali. They don't have an account. It goes through a cell phone and they have a PIN number. All of these things are very relevant to ordinary people. So please, Treasury. Can you, uh, let me start from myself. So I would like to know like a 15 year old, how would you explain to a 15 year old, what is cryptocurrency? What is blockchain and all those terms? Why is it here? Where is it going? How does it benefit the unbanked and poor people? How is it a problem? Because we read in the media that people even in this country, you will recall, I think I saw Momo here one case, well, I'd refer to the FSCA, where this one person came to me and said they've been robbed. And then I read later in the media that that firm, I think Cape Town based, is now in trouble. Who's protecting? Who's protecting the relatively poorer strata who may probably be less uh, digitally uh, and technologically uh, or fair? So, so, so really, uh, can somebody please help in both teams to explain the terms very simply, there are a lot of new members here who came in 2019, but even an oldie like me, I battle with it, really. Thank you. Over to Treasury. I thought I saw Momo here as well, is it? And who else? I can't see here. Uh, Cindy is always here, the great Cindy, uh, August 8th. Momo, when are you all going to give Cindy some award for duty to ser service to the National Treasury? and service to the parliament and the country. It's a high time, really, which is a very good. Uh, ask me, I mean, how many committees have I chaired? Momo, you know that. She's got the best parliamentary liaison officer we have. And this has nothing to do with the fact that she happens to be married to my homeboy. <laughs> She's very good. Ask the oldies, ask the Kaledi. Yeah, yeah right. no. Over to you, no. Momo, and team. No, oh, no chair, friend, and, friend and, af friend and friend. afternoon to all the members. Before you go and on, I'm telling you, Momo, Brandon used to be a member of our committee, Momo, uh, and guess what? He was actually in the DA at the time. And guess what, Dennis? We used to take him very seriously because he wasn't like narrowly ideological. He was committed to the DA then, but he was prepared to give us simple explanations of quite difficult content. So he's, he's also somebody who can explain things simply, I'm sure. All right, over to you, Momo. Recording stopped. Yeah, no chair, thanks. I see it says recording stopped. That's good. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> because I was but, but, I want, but what I wanted to say, chair, is that uh, an afternoon to honorable members, um, but I, and, and to, we've got a massive team here, chair, but I wanted to say, the day we stop implementing the PFMA like as if it's the Exchequer Act and bring more rationality into government, then we can do rational things like rewarding people who work hard. Uh, but currently, there's a fear <laughs> of God in the public service 
that the AG will regard everything as irregular or fruitless expenditure. I feel very strongly about it, Chair. And want I know to you've argue, been battering me about it. And want years. to argue that the PFMA is no longer is implemented like it's the Exchequer Act, and that will basically impact on delivery. And I wish Parliament would have a discussion on that. I would love to be there because it's an important topic if you want delivery. But Chair, oh, no, 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 okay. uh, so before you move on, you've been raising this with me in my previous role. And I saw you say it somewhere else in the public domain. You're not the only one to say it. Now, obviously, colleagues, can we think about this and approach the, the NA committee? We shouldn't, like, leave it hanging in the air. I would like committee members to think about it. And in Kululeko, can you put it on the agenda of our next quarter uh, uh, issues? Let's speak to the NA committee. We should do it together. But obviously, more more you know there's another side to this. I know what you're trying to say. You explained it to me in great detail over the phone and you have been badgering us in the committee last year. And because of your role for the last four or 5,000 years in Treasury, I, I would like to take what you're saying seriously. Because whatever else people accuse you of and they're free to do so today, you can never accuse you of like not having a strong work ethic and being above board in other respects. And you know that the previous committee, we said it many times. So I think we should put this issue on the agenda, Momo. In Kululeko, can you note that? But the point I also want to make, Momo, obviously one is cautious about tinkering with the PFMA and so on. Also, we'll need to bring the auditing Auditor General's committee in as well. So we can't just do it on our own. But the point is that when people want to attack the PFMA, often, it's people who are facing some or other court trial or some or other accusation of having violated it, uh, uh, some or other misdemeanor. So then they blame the PFMA. You will recall, by the way, colleagues, when the MFMA was passed, it was actually passed by the Finance Committee. But I happened to be chairing the local government committee at the time. I can tell you I was battered by various people who said, oh, you presuppose that we're going to do wrong even before it happens and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and so, 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 you know, like a theory that, you know, you think all the civil servants at local government level are wrongdoers and you're trying to preempt it and so on. And then I took an address a few seminars. Unfortunately, in my province, the PEC official, the chairperson of the ANC also came in and made it clear that this is correct, what was done. So one of the problems, Momo, is that people want this PFMA question for other reasons. But the government and the ANC legitimately is also raising questions about the PFMA from different angles. So remember, once we open it up, it will not just be around the issues you're raising, uh, but let's do it. Because if it's holding back civil servants who are terrified that they're going to be attacked or the department they're in are going to be attacked and or they'll end up in some commission where they have to answer whatever the commission might be, uh, uh, obviously, it's going to cause paralysis. So, Mama, let's put this issue on the agenda. No, no, Chair, also, Chair, right? Chair, just, just my 30 seconds worth. I'm not no. calling for any major amendments to the PFMA. I think it's a question of interpretation. The yes. same PFMA in its first 10 years was, was adhered to very differently than in the last 10 years. And a lot of this has to do with also, I think, how the Auditor General has developed much more of a rules-based tick box approach. And I think parliament also taking a particular approach uh, so that obviously the dishonest ones ignore the PFMA, the honest ones become more risk averse and don't want to do anything for fear of breaking rules. But we can move on from those, Chair. Chair, yeah, I think right, so let's, that, uh, let's move on. on, the, presentation, let's on, on the presentation, just to come back to it, um, we've got a large team here and I think that you are asking the right questions. Um, uh, firstly, I think uh, some of us do belong to an age group where we find it very hard to understand these issues. And I think that if you look at uh, even the use of the word cryptocurrency, I don't know why we even have it on our title, because we have gone to extraordinary lengths to call them crypto assets because they are not a currency. And the more that, that 
that as you've had like with Bitcoin, I mean, they use words like they are money. And by the way, many people think because the government's not involved, it's a good thing. They can get round government. So you get on the one hand, many people involved with money laundering or bad thoughts or getting cross-border flows kind of uh, uh, supporting this currency or others who are just skeptical of government and therefore they support this currency. But I, but, I, but I think it raises the important issue that you've raised. How do you protect the public from an unregulated product? And, I, you know, the, the uh, chairman of the Fed, Jay Powell, recently sort of made a statement to say something to the effect that, uh, uh, you know, a, a cryptocurrency, like you're taking chances, uh, uh, it's basically speculation and that it's like relying on gold. You know, gold is not money. People give it a value. And if people didn't give it a value, it would not have a value. So you are getting into a very difficult domain. I am afraid that our team's not going to satisfy you from the perspective that the concepts are difficult. And I think many people are, have difficulty in following. So I'm going to ask the team to come through and try and explain it simply. But I wanted to start off by just saying, you know, generally in the international meetings that we go, it's called a crypto asset. It's not a currency. It's not recognized as money. And to the extent that it's recognized in countries, some countries obviously have taken one extreme view of banning. Other countries have said, no, we, you, you, you know, you can't really ban it. Uh, but you need to regulate it and are kind of approaching it that way. Chair, you'll see now just, and, and the um, earlier presentation did refer to the huge uh, committee that we have across the regulators who are working on this and, and in a process of, in fact, publishing a whole approach, uh, a discussion paper and a whole approach to regulating uh, um, uh, these uh, crypto assets. But I'm going to ask Ola to come in and lead the pack on uh, on this. Ola? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mamo. Good afternoon, uh, members, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ola Utamatane from the National Treasury, responsible for the Financial Sector Development Unit. Now, Chair, I, <laughs> you're not the only one who's struggling with this concept. So I'm in that age group where I'm, I'm half sort Recording of- Recording in progress. I understand half of it and half of it, it it's still uh, very technical to me. So you're not the only one, Chair, uh, finding these concepts very, very difficult to, to understand. Now, also just to, Momo, just to your point, so this particular heading, is the, how the request came from the Select Committee on Finance that we present on a guide to understanding major cryptocurrency issues. But in the presentation, we actually explain that uh, the term that we use is crypto assets because these cannot quite be uh, called cryptocurrencies. Uh, All right, we withdraw that. That was me. Uh, I just use the term because I see it in the media, but uh, we accept what you're saying, crypto assets and sport. Yes, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Just also to, to explain that on the line, we've got colleagues from uh, National Treasury, the FSCA, the South African Reserve Bank, the Prudential Authority, the FIC, as well as SARS. And Chair, as and when needed, I might ask uh, some of the colleagues to come in and assist me with, with some of the, the slides. Now, looking at the time, Chair, I will start uh, with my presentation. And with your permission, I'm going to ask that I stop my video and I can switch it on again uh, uh, later on, Chair. So moving Who's along. On? Yeah, okay, good. Yes, moving along, Chair, this is what we will cover in this presentation. I'll move very swiftly. Uh, just setting the scene. What we wanted to do here is the understanding of crypto assets that it, it is a subset of fintech uh, understanding that uh, fintech is technologically enabled financial innovation 
that can result in new business models, applications, processes, products, or services. But what we see with crypto assets, I think it has taken this definition really to a whole new level, hence uh, the complexity. The business models, the applications, and the processes are way more complex than we see with the other uh, fintech innovations that are out there. Uh, in 2019, National Treasury, as part of the IFWG, uh, we, we commissioned research uh, on, on looking at the South African landscape of, of fintech companies. And we found that the research found that fintech activity in South Africa has actually been on the rise. And the study uncovered over 220 fintech companies. And this pie chart just shows uh, that at least 30% of the fintechs in operation are payments and payments really continue to dominate the space. We see that uh, business to business technical support, at least 20% of the companies are in that space. And then other players are in the space of insure tech, lending, savings and deposits and, and capital raising. Just moving along quickly. Just to make the presentation a practical change, these are some of the key, key fintech players in the, in the fintech ecosystem in South Africa. Notably here, I've chosen Luno. Luno is a digital currency platform or exchange. So if you want to buy and sell your Bitcoin, you will go to Luno and, and do that. Uh, Luno is, is the well-known exchange. If you drive on the N1, they've got adverts on the highway. They say that you can buy Bitcoin for as little as, as 10 rents, which I think is it's somewhat uh, uh, misleading to the public given the current price of, of Bitcoin. The other interesting uh, fintech player in the space is called Sun Exchange. It is a solar leasing platform and they've got a wallet. So in this uh, Sun Exchange wallet, chair, you can actually buy uh, using Bitcoin, you can buy uh, solar electricity cells. Again, another uh, complex matter that can be discussed at another time. Uh, the previous speakers have spoken about the IFWG chair and uh, National Treasury is part of that. And also just to note that the IFWG has since grown to include the NCR SARS as well as the competition. And also to note that only the National Treasury and SARS are the ones that are not regulators. Otherwise, the rest of the group are regulators. The IFWG has got a vision chair. This can be found on the IFWG website. And the vision is for South Africa to be a leading fintech hub for Africa, promoting financial inclusion, which is a subject that is very close to my heart. And then while also sparing competition, digital skills and economic growth. And we see that uh, the four building blocks and one of those blocks is enhancing legal and regulatory environment to promote innovation and competition. And that is precisely uh, what we're trying to do in the crypto assets uh, space chair. Just moving along as part of the IFWG, we've got what is called the Innovation Hub. This is a, a centralized innovation capability that is shared by all the participating regulators. It's got three components. It's got the regulatory sandbox, the regulatory guidance unit, and then the innovation accelerator. Now, the, the regulatory sandbox chair is just a safe space for experimenting. It is a control environment that offers regulatory relief. So if I want to do something that is not yet catered for in the current regulation, I approach the regulatory sandbox to say, I've got this idea that I want to test. And then you are then either accepted uh, to test your idea within the regulatory sandbox. Now, here's the interesting thing, chair, Currently in this regulatory uh, sandbox, there were seven companies that successfully got through after the, the due diligence, the assessment by, by the IFWG teams that are responsible for the sandbox. Of the seven companies that made it, four of them were crypto related companies. And this information is publicly available on the 
IFWG website. Just to mention, uh, I'll pause and mention what these companies do. So the first company, uh, they offer, they want to test safe custody services using the digital asset vault. The second company, they want to test the XCON regulations using cross-border remittances when you use crypto assets. The third one, they are testing the regulatory treatment of uh, with regards to regulatory reporting and obligations of crypto assets. Again, uh, this is cross-border remittances. And then the last company, uh, they are testing low value cross-border remittances between South Africa and Ghana using crypto assets. So interesting, Chair, seven companies, four of those in the regulatory sandbox are testing crypto-related uh, uh, activities. Now within the, and then the third component of, of the hub is the innovation accelerator. So within the innovation accelerator, we look at the IFWG zooms in, a, they deep dive on certain topics. And this is just to put the crypto assets work that the IFWG is doing into context to say there are other projects uh, that the IFWG is doing through the Innovation Accelerator issues of non-traditional data. There's a paper uh, that was uh, produced there for, for public comment, another paper produced by the FSCA on open banking, uh, no, 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 by the NPSD on open banking, and then digital platforms uh, work that was done again by the, by the, by the FSCA. And other work, uh, Chair, this is really a presentation for another day. Each of these three prioritized initiatives are a presentation on their own, Chair. Now, just to delve in now in terms of crypto assets. Uh, you've said that the previous uh, definitions or presentations were too technical and, and confusing. I'm not sure if this will help you, Chair, but the definition of crypto assets that we use at the IFWG and as part of the, the crypto assets regulatory working group, we say that it's a digital representation of value. So the key word there is digital. And we say that it is not issued by a central bank, but traded, transferred, or stored electronically by either natural or legal persons used for the purpose of payment, investment, or other form of utility for the user. Now, conceptually, I, I also don't know what the digital representation of value is and what it looks like. And I am planning to buy <laughs> some Bitcoin on Lunar just to check exactly how this thing actually uh, works. And as the previous presenters have indicated, the enabling technology where this uh, digital currencies run is known as blockchain. But what is interesting with blockchain is that it can be used for other things as well. And one of the things that are, are usually spoken about here is smart contracts, where you can have a, a, a safely uh, stored contract value chain that is not intercepted by, by anyone. But I can share, I'm, I'm sure some of my colleagues on the line can explain this in a much more uh, acceptable or understandable way. Moving along. No, I think you're doing very well. You're doing very well so far. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, moving along, as, as we've said, and as Momo has said, why we are saying crypto asset and not cryptocurrency, we all know that currency is money and it's legal tender and it's, it's banknotes and coins that we know that are issued by the sub. Uh, however, crypto assets are not money, they are not legal tender. However, I must note, Chair, that uh, when we come to the next slide, you will see that uh, there could be some crypto assets that, that are issued by, by a central bank. But for the purposes of this presentation, we are talking about crypto assets that are not issued by a central bank. Also, just to note that crypto assets has, has thus far largely failed in its ambition to be a wildly, widely used payment instrument, I think precisely because of its volatility. So Chair, the previous speakers have spoken about the central bank digital currency. This is a digital currency 
issued by a central bank, and this is a subset of crypto assets, as I've said earlier. The research of the Bank of International Settlements in 2021 has shown that at least 86% of central banks are actively researching the potential of, of these CBDCs. 60% are experimenting with the technology. I must say here, Chair, to say, including our own South African Reserve Bank, they've got a project called Project COCA where they are looking at uh, issuing CBDC. And I think some of my colleagues on the line can explain exactly how that works. 14% of these are deploying pilot projects. Now, China seems to be way ahead of the others. It is expected to be the first major economy to launch CBDC. And the European Central Bank is also quite advanced in considering launching a digital euro. Stable coins, my previous, uh, the previous speakers have spoken about uh, stable coins, Chair, I will not go into that. And I've also explained that for the purposes of this, this presentation, when we speak about crypto assets, these are non-government and non-central bank issued or backed uh, type of assets. Now, the problem with the, with the, defin with the narrow definition of, of crypto assets, Chair, is that they perform different functions depending on their design or on their use. They cut across uh, clearly segregated areas such as payments, investment, uh, payment raising, securities, cross-border remittances, and they also continue to evolve and add new use cases. Now, as members of the car working group, we now and then receive uh, presentations from some of the crypto asset service providers. And I must say, Chair, if you think this is confusing, uh, wait for a presentation on non-fungible tokens and you literally feel your stomach turning because the stuff is so technical and you wonder how as regulators we are going to get around uh, some of these things, Chair. I'll just uh, whiz through the slide, Chair. My previous uh, presenters have spoken a lot about Bitcoin. Just to note that as of May 2021, there were over 9,000 unique crypto assets. Again, just adding to the, to the complexity of, of, of this asset share. I'm not sure how I'm doing in terms of time, but trying to move very quickly, Chair. No, uh, look, look, can I suggest, uh, because you're explaining the concepts to us, uh, the more I think about it, colleagues, we'll need to follow up on this thing. Uh, unless colleagues feel differently, I think carry on at the pace you are. Uh, we will find another slot very soon to, 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 to take things forward rather than leaving it for too long. Is that agreeable to members? Let's not push, push Ms. Bachane right now because she's doing it quite, I think, relatively accessibly in user-friendly ways. Is anybody who objects to her, you know, at this pace going through it? I don't hear any objections. No, no, Chairperson, is, 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 I think it's, it's still fine. Okay, well, there's Mr. Njadu. He's the most powerful person here, even more than me. Mr. Dennis Ryder doesn't count, but he's, uh, let's see what he's saying. He's saying we are learning, prefer to hear explanation. Oh, for once he's making some sense. All right. <laughs> I couldn't resist that, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I am yeah. happy. I'm happy to continue and just to say that I think it's, it's almost impossible to, to talk about such a complex topic in three hours, Chair. So I think certainly. No, no, I agree with you. Look, I hadn't thought it through very carefully. Uh, you know, I must confess, I should have, you know, in the discussion in Kolileko called both of you separately. We just wanted different perspectives on this, but you're right. Uh, I, I plead guilt and uh, I will uh, consider resigning, okay? Uh, provided Dennis doesn't support it. Sorry, carry, carry on, carry on. Thank you, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to- about to second the proposal, damn it. <laughs> right, for that reason, <laughs> for precisely that reason, I will step down, okay? Now, uh, continuing, Chair, given uh, the time constraints, so crypto assets have grown rapidly over uh, the last few years in South Africa. 
Now, these two graphs, Chair, the first graph shows that there's, there's been a significant growth in the number of users. In 2019, we recorded at least 880,000 retail investors in crypto. In 2021, we are talking about at least 2 million investors. And I can assure you, Chair, that half of these people, they just don't understand how, they're like you and I, they, they don't quite grasp the concept but they're investing because how these are advertised, people are told that uh, the return of, of 50%, 60% and people fall for, for these kinds of things. We also see a growth in the transaction values chair. In 2019, we recorded a figure of about 225 million rents. Today in 2021, we are talking about at least 2 billion in transactions. And I think this slide just shows that crypto assets have, have really become too big to ignore and they pose a number of risks for consumers if they are not sufficiently uh, regulated. Now, again, I just wanted to make uh, this presentation relatable, Chair. These are just some of the, the headlines that we are seeing in the crypto asset space. Uh, I'll pick on one or two. The one I'll pick on is the pick and pay one where it successfully tested Bitcoin as a payment instrument sometime in 2017. However, I must note that they did indicate that they are unlikely to roll this out to their other branches. So they tested this in one of their stores in Cape Town. And they are saying that they are unlikely to roll out the solution until the payments industry and the regulatory authorities uh, have established a framework for managing the risk associated with crypto assets. Uh, just to note that the statement uh, may be misleading somehow because some of the risks cannot be removed by regulation. So for example, the risk of volatility of these uh, crypto assets cannot be removed by regulation chair. Another interesting one that I can pick up, uh, there's a young man by the name of Mpodagada. If you uh, Google Bitcoin in South Africa, his name pops up. He has written a book, How I Became a Millionaire at, at 21. He claims to have become a Bitcoin millionaire at the age of 21. I haven't read the book, Chair, so I don't know how, how he did it. Other headlines uh, take a lot, uh, apparently takes Bitcoin. I don't know. I haven't uh, tested it. One of the articles here talks about the, how the Garden Roots residents uh, lost at least 5 million to a cryptocurrency scam. There's a company called Trinity Token Investments that's set up uh, in the Garden Route along George, Plattenberg Bay, uh, Mossel Bay, promising people again huge returns. And overnight, the company just packed and left. And ordinary uh, South Africans like you and I had uh, invested their heart and uh, monies into this uh, company and they were really scammed uh, with nothing to show for and no recourse as well. They can then go to the FSCA or any of the regulators to say that they've been scammed. In terms of the approaches, Chair, uh, there are three approaches available for, for South Africa to think through. The first one is a complete ban. Uh, but I think we are way past the stage uh, as members of FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, we really pass the stage. And again, with 2 million investors already investing in this thing, I'm not sure how a complete ban would work. Again, if you are going to ban something, you might just drive uh, underground activities, but also the policing will become very resource intensive. The second option chair is to do nothing. So the, the current uh, status quo continues. We've got no specific regulation. Uh, however, there are some of the risks that, you know, it, it makes it impossible for regulators to just sit and do nothing. So at the end of the day, Chair, I think, and also why this presentation is, is so important today is that South Africa has no choice but to regulate the crypto asset uh, activities and we need to do so very quickly. Looking at just some of the, the jurisdictions uh, in, in other countries, some countries are, are very restrictive, uh, like China and India. I think China has just recently issued new restrictions for the use of, of Bitcoin and, and crypto assets. 
Uh, some are facilitative. So these are, you know, sort of lukewarm between being restrictive and accommodative. And then some are, are very accommodative. I must say that the country that comes to mind here is the country which I, its name I cannot uh, pronounce it. It's called Liechtenstein. It's somewhere between Switzerland and Austria. So Chair, apparently this is the only country in the world where crypto assets or cryptocurrency is actually legal tender. So I think uh, developments from that country will be quite interesting. And again, just looking at the UK, the UK has banned the sale of crypto assets derivatives to retail consumers in the UK, stating that these are very risky, very toxic products that are not uh, suitable for consumption by by retail consumers. Now, if we look at the USA, I think there's more more mentioned in his opening remarks. This is what uh, Jay Powell said. And this is important because somebody like, like Jeremy Powell is somebody who is powerful and influential. So if he makes a statement like this, the world listens. So he has said that uh, crypto assets are more a speculative asset. It's essentially a substitute for gold rather than the dollar. The public needs to understand the risks. The principal thing here is there's volatility and the fact that they are not uh, backed by anything. So this was really, I think, a, a powerful statement made by, by Jay Powell Chair. And then moving along, uh, the difficulty in, in regulation of, of these crypto asset activities, Chair, is the is the legacy laws that we have and the because they were all drafted be, before emerging financial innovations such as crypto assets were even a concept. So for example, the SAP Act talks about no, notes and coins that are issued by the SAP. We've got the NPS Act also talking about notes issued by the SAP. Uh, E-money as well, only to be issued by licensed South African banks. We've got the Banks Act that uh, refers to deposits. De deposit refers to money, which is legal tender as defined in the Sub Act and then the ex exchange control regulations. Now, the, what I forgot to put on the slide, Chair, is that even the Financial Sector Regulation Act, which is really about, what, three years old now, four years old, no, neither does it recognize crypto assets either in the definition of financial product or in the definition of financial services. So we are sitting with all these legacy laws and regulations that in no way uh, recognize uh, crypto assets. Now, Chair, uh, so I'm now going to talk about the crypto assets journey and uh, where we are in, at the moment in terms of the regulation of these uh, crypto assets. So the previous speaker chair spoke about, I need to move my slide. The, the previous speaker spoke about the crypto assets regulatory working group that was established in 2018 under the auspices of the IFWG. Now we are on the verge, Chair. I'm hoping latest by the 2nd of June that we will be able to publish the final crypto asset position paper under the auspices of the IFWG. There is my colleague on the line by the name of uh, Herko. He's the from the FinTech unit of the SAP. He's the chair of the car working group and really has, has done a sterling job in terms of uh, pulling everyone's inputs together to put this paper together, Chair. Uh, so in the paper, the paper goes through five uh, use cases that we have in South Africa of crypto assets. The first one is the buying and selling of crypto assets, mainly used for speculative investing as a medium of exchange or for buying and then immediately on selling, so that's the buying and selling. The second use case is the one of payments. You can either use it to buy goods and services. And however, we, we can take 
talk later on, Chair, that uh, the, the South African Reserve Bank and the NPSG department are very cautious when it comes to the use of payments. So if you are a, a retailer wanting to use crypto as a payment instrument, you can do it, but you're on your own. Uh, there is no regulatory framework, obviously, that, that covers uh, payment services. Initial coin offering I means of uh, raising capital by issuing digital tokens to the public. Uh, the issuer will use the funds to finance, for example, a specific project or sometimes a new company, a new startup company. Investment funds here, crypto assets are used as an underlying reference asset for various investment funds, including, for example, hedge funds, uh, private equity. You will see later on, Chair, our stance when it comes to collective investment schemes and, and pension funds, for example. And then lastly, the last use case that we have here is really just the market support. This is the support services provided in respect of crypto asset activities. These, are, these activities may include safe custody services for crypto assets, digital wallet provisioning for crypto assets, as well as crypto assets mining. Moving along to some of the key risks, which I think my previous, uh, the previous speakers have, have touched on money laundering, exchange control circumvention, cyber security, price volatility, financial stability. I think we are now very familiar with the risk chair. On this slide, we just wanted to zoom in on the specific conduct risks that the FSCA uh, is monitoring closely and, and will do so even more going forward once we've uh, sorted out the regulatory framework issues. So issues such as fraud and, and cyber crime, complexity of the products, I'm not sure we will win there, but I'm sure the, the FSCA will compel some of these cusps uh, to explain to consumers in very uh, understandable terms how these things work. But I think most importantly, explaining to the consumer the risks embedded. The problem that we have when we see the adverts of this cusp, they only tell you the upside and they never tell you the downside. Sometimes excessive fees, uh, as I've indicated, misleading advertising, just focusing on the upsides, unclear price formation and, and pricing practices. Uh, these are just some of the the issues chair and in order to medicate to mitigate the above risk the fsca has issued two warnings on crypto assets and is currently embarking on a process to designate crypto assets under the financial advisory and intermediary services act to enable greater regulatory oversight and this i can touch on later now chair here this is just to this is the top 10 cryptocurrency investment schemes what is interesting here is that this Mira Trading International, this, was, this is a company that was operating in South Africa. So that blue dot that you see there at the end is like South Africa, uh, uh, leading in, in something that it should not be leading in. And just to say that this Mira Trading International, it was estimated that at least 300,000 local and international investors were involved and they lost at least 8 billion in their savings. Uh, it is said to be the largest crypto scam in South Africa and the largest global scam in 2020. Uh, astonishing share, but uh, let's move on. Now, this is what is contained in the, in the car working group paper chair that, that I just said, we are hoping that by the 2nd of June, we should be able to to publish just to show the public uh, what, they, they, what the intentions of the regulators are uh, going forward in the space. Now in the paper, there are 25 recommendations chair, but I think here we are just summarizing and grouping them into, into categories. The first group of recommendations are around the implementation of an AML CFT framework where we are proposing the amendment of the FIC Act, Schedule 1, to include uh, crypto asset service providers, or you can also call it virtual asset service providers, 
as accountable institutions. Now, uh, in my some of my preliminary discussions with the FIC colleagues, this is already in progress. I understand that an amendment uh, bill was uh, issued for, for public comment sometime last year. The second group of uh, recommendations, Chair, are around how to most appropriately to cater for crypto assets under current South African laws. The Phase Act Declaration, the FSCA issued a, a discussion paper late last year for public comment. I understand they are in the process of, of going through those comments. Now, the Phase Act Declaration, uh, members need to understand this is a, a, a transitional measure or an interim, let me call it an interim measure, as we are in the process of finalizing the coffee bill. The ultimate aim is that the coffee bill, which, in, which is an activity-based uh, type of framework, it will include all crypto asset related activities in the coffee bill. So whoever is, is uh, conducting an activity that is related to crypto, they'll then be captured by the coffee bill. The FSR Act, we would need to amend the definitions of a financial service to include crypto assets. The Financial Market Act will need to accommodate uh, securities, the definition of securities to include crypto assets, as well as the National Payment System Act uh, to accommodate crypto assets uh, there. So that's the second uh, pillar. The third pillar chair is the framework for monitoring cross-border financial flows. And the recommendations here are amending the exchange control regulations to include uh, crypto assets. So amending the authorized dealer manual as well as the authorized dealers with limited authority framework to include crypto asset service providers. What is important to note here and the reason we've put it in the box, at the moment, Chair, we are very clear. Retirement funds and collective investment schemes are not allowed any exposure to crypto assets. We don't want a situation where people who have saved all their lives uh, in a retirement fund to retire at the time when uh, something globally has happened and the price of uh, virtual assets have plunged and your retirement funds are down to zero. So here, Chair, we are taking really a very, very, very cautious approach uh, towards exposure to retirement funds and collective investment schemes because the people who will be mostly hurt here are the retail investors. I'm, I'm coming to, uh, I'm going to close now, Chair. Uh, this is probably the, the second last slide. Some of the key considerations and, and takeaways. The first one, Chair, is that I think we, are, we loosely talk about the regulation of crypto assets. But I think what is important to note here is that the regulation is not on the product because this is something that, is, that will be almost impossible. But what we are, what we are proposing to regulate is the activities of these crypto asset service providers, uh, whether as exchanges, as wallet providers, when they provide advice, uh, when they do sales and execution of these crypto assets, they will be captured in the regulatory framework. So again, as I indicated earlier, Chair, we cannot protect the, the members of the public from the price of Bitcoin plunging for example, but we are trying to make sure that when Luno sells you this Bitcoin, that the disclosures are right, that uh, their advertising is right, and that uh, they've got all the, and that the KEKYC is properly done. All of those requirements are, are covered here. There's the second, uh, which is for me is the most important one, is that the decision to regulate CUSPs, members need to understand, members of the public. It does not suggest endorsement, whether tacit or explicit of crypto asset. In no way are we saying to the people, because we are regulating it, it's something that you should be encouraged to, to invest in. The third point, which is related to number two, is that crypto assets remain highly volatile and inherently risky further compounded by scam activity with many Ponzi type 
schemes, unfortunately. Fourthly, the, the, the ecosystem, the crypto assets ecosystem is evolving at such a rapid pace and developments continue to challenge the applicability of existing legislation. I indicated earlier that there's at least over 9,000 types of crypto assets. I've indicated earlier that uh, people in, along the garden route were scammed. And this is just uh, the world that we live in Chair. Point number five, uh, crypto assets marketing material often strongly biased towards highlighting only the potential upside of crypto assets with no consideration for the massive potential downside. And I think here in particular, that's why the FSCA needs to come in strongly in terms of some of the, the disclosures. Lastly, the most important one, crypto assets to remain without legal tender status and not recognized as electronic money. As I've, as I've indicated earlier, Chair, in my research, there's only one country in the world actually that recognizes crypto assets as legal tender. Just in closing, Chair, some of the guiding principles for the regulatory approach, we all agree that uh, the crypto asset service providers, and as I've, as I've indicated, the activities that they perform must be regulated and regulated appropriately. An activities-based perspective needs to be maintained and the principle of same activity, same risk and same regulation must continue. And this is what we are doing, for example, some of the principles we are bringing in the coffee bill. We talk about risk-based and proportionate type of regulation and supervision. Proportionate, the third point, proportionate regulations commensurate to the risks posed must apply. That is what I've just said. A collaborative and joint approach to the regulation of us must be maintained. And I think that's why the IFWG is such a powerful group because that's where we are able to maintain this, this collaboration and the joint approach. And then just lastly, Chair, continuing to proactively monitor the dynamic developments of the crypto assets market, including maintaining knowledge on emerging international best practices. This is my story, Chair. I will, I will stop here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. No, thanks, thanks. That's, that's really very good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, right, over to members. Uh, there's an exchange in the chat group that asks members to read up the exchange between Saraj and Dennis. Okay. Uh, over then to members, uh, hands raised in Kulilepo, who's there? I see this Dennis, Willie, Maletsani. Hi, welcome back, Maletsani. Uh, can I just ask, is this um, Mr. Makube? Are, are, are you from the Finance Sector Conduct Authority, formerly from Treasury? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, sorry? Mr. Makubela? Okay, so this is Mr. Makubela. This is Errol Makubela from the National Treasury Chair. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. I'm with the all National right. Treasury. It's not Olano okay. Makubela, but Errol Makubela. Oh, Errol. Okay, yeah, I wondered because I saw Errol. I thought maybe that's his Christian name. All right, fine. Welcome to you too. So I see there are people from the FSC. I see Brent, Brandon. You can come in as well because you deal with these issues. Uh, but in the meanwhile, let's take the hands we have. And that's one, two, three Jano? so far. Jadu, or, or, yes, certainly. Okay, go for it, colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Yes, and thank you very, very much for the presentations. I'm really, really pleased that we're talking about this and, and that we are becoming informed. So, uh, Ms. Machane, yes, I think that uh, your presentation I particularly enjoyed and was particularly inform informative. Um, yeah, and then to the gentleman from Treasury, uh, by comparison, you probably are more honourable than most. So, 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 so take the title with, with joy. Um, Chair, yes, I think many of my questions have actually been answered by that that, that second presentation. It, it really was informative, and hence the fact that I thought that uh, that that we needed to continue with it, because it answered most of my questions that I had written down. Um, and I'm really particularly pleased to to learn of the existence of the fintech working group because uh, you know it, it means that there's there's a degree of proactivity uh, and and cross-pollination 
which is so important, uh, intergovernmental cross-pollination, all of these entities that tend to work in silos but are intrinsically linked. So I was particularly pleased to hear of the existence of, of, of the FinTech Working Group. Um, and um, yeah, the, the statistics as well. So the number, the number of transactors was one of my questions. Uh, the role of the FSCA, I, I think perhaps Brandon can come in and I know that I'll slow you lunch, but um, perhaps Brandon can come in and tell us a little bit more about, about the FSCA's role um, particularly because, look, I mean, there's 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 a couple of of of, of really really serious issues, and I suppose the one is exchange control, the other one is revenue collection, and the last one is investor protection. Um, and yeah, we've all seen the ads of you know buy your cryptocurrency here. Uh, you know, every time you pick your your cell phone up, there's an advert playing that says you know this is where you where you can get and store your cryptocurrency and so on. So, you know, is there a role for, for the FSCA to play, particularly because, you know, as, as has been said, it's not a currency, um, it's a commodity, I guess. So, so yeah, um, perhaps Brandon, uh, Mr. Topham can, can uh, give us some guidance on that. Um, I enjoyed the fact that, that, that you pointed out the different regulation trends internationally. Um, um, and, and, you know, you spoke about listening not listening to the noise not not being being sucked into the noise but there's there's a huge amount of noise out there uh at the moment and and so many people getting getting involved with without the information and so i think that's why we really wanted to to have this presentation so we could understand a little bit better what's being done from government's point of view in terms of of of, of protecting people and protecting uh, the economy to a degree as well as I said, you know, you've got the re revenue collection problem and the exchange control issue. Uh, and, you know, the fact that retailers, I mean, I saw on the screen there, pick and pay, um, have started considering or piloted uh, accepting Bitcoin um, for, for, for groceries, which is, 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 is seriously, you know, it, it, it's a big and quick sudden move um, and quite a bold move on their part. But it just shows that there is obviously an, a general acceptance of this. So, so I think that that the um, the move to ban crypto assets, cryptocurrency, crypto exchange, whatever, uh, I, I think is short sighted because the fact is that clearly there's a need for it. But what I particularly don't understand, and and, and I'm not sure who can answer this question best, because with with the ease of exchange and and Eunice was talking about it in, in his introduction as well it's become so easy to trade to transact you know you can tap and go with your card uh everyone can have can 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 get uh, a check card or, or or a debit card these days uh for any type of account so that you can use those facilities you can buy things online um, you know, you can send money without having a bank account, without without using the cards, et cetera, et cetera. So it's become incredibly easy to transact. So what purpose would there then be for something like a cryptocurrency, um, other than someone trying to start a, a giant Ponzi scheme or or, 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 or or something? And the only the only explanation I can have for that is it's the lack of of regulation, um, and. You know, I, I understand that internationally there's a move away from governments, autonomy, and so on. But but am I right in saying that's the biggest selling point of a cryptocurrency is that it's it's actually got a lack of regulation, which which starts me questioning or, or begs the question that the last question I wanted to ask is: Is there space for government-backed cryptocurrency uh, or a government-backed crypto crypto assets? Sorry. Uh, Momo, but is is there also space for a government-backed crypto exchange? You know, what what is the potential here um, to to kind of take the leading edge on this thing? Because you know, and, and I see that there was mention of of some of the the countries that have done something like this. Um, uh, I note from the comments that, that we're not quite at that stage, um, but you know, is there is is there some thought going into that um, going forward? Just giving us some guideline into the you know, is it something? Where would you fit us in those three columns in terms of the people that are are restrictive, that are 
uh, putting up with it and then the people that are broadly embracing it. Where does South Africa fit uh, from a treasury perspective, from a SARS perspective, uh, and from a planning perspective going forward? Chair, again, just really appreciating the the the, the information that we've had and the fact that you uh, you, you you put this this schedule this meeting for us to to learn about this. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Yeah, I assume it's me. It's really speaking. Jay, yeah. thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much. I also want to thank the presenters for uh, an excellently presented uh, uh, to us today. It really gave me some insight. You know, Chair, I'm with you on that. I always joke and say that I'm technologically disadvantaged. Uh, and then tongue in cheek, when I shop at the Hi-Fi Corporation, I stop on the disabled parking because I can. I'm totally <laughs> disabled when it comes to that. So, yeah, Chairperson, this was very informative for me. And I'm going to keep my question very short because it's a thing that I've been wondering and that people have discussed with me in the past as well. I understand that taxation on crypto assets can easily be done with the end seller. Let's say I am a guy that sells soap and I uh, accept cryptocurrency or crypto asset as a method of payment. I will have to pay taxes on the amount of soap that I sell. My question is, what is the position on a layman's point? Explain it to me as if I am a 50-year-old, which I will be in less than a year. Uh, what is the taxation regulations when it comes to trading with these cryptocurrencies? In other words, I go and I buy X amount of Bitcoin, and in a month's time, I sell it for 5,000 rands more than I have bought it for. What is the taxation on that and how is it going to be regulated? As I, as I said, I understand that it's easy to uh, regulate the tax on a seller that sells soap and he must pay tax on, on, on his income. But how is it going to be regulated with regards to the people that's trading with that and the profits that's made on that? Thank you very much, Chairperson. And again, thank you to the presentations. It was excellent. Thanks. Okay, next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me also join the colleagues to acknowledge the both presentations. And I hope that uh, actually the second presentation covered uh, most of my questions that I, that I had. The only question that I'm left with is uh, to Dr. Janjis. On slide nine, uh, they, they've written there that uh, there, there are myths on crypto uh, cryptocurrencies that are mentioned there. I just want to check with him whether are they just a myth or there are some truth in some of those uh, myths that are, that are mentioned there. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. And then it's Mr. Njadu, right? Yes, 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 thank you, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. It, yeah, Chairperson, go ahead. I, I think from yes, from my point of view, Chair, is that uh, firstly to welcome um, these presentations uh, because I believe it's of very, very importance. Because um, when we listen to the presentations and also to check in terms of this matter to be to be introduced to parliament because as the finance committee is is critical that we 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 become in advance of this matter because it's 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 actual in terms of the presentation there's no turning point because it's already worldwide uh, buy in and it's affecting south africa because you have already you have consumers in south africa and a huge, a big number of consumers. So, so Chairperson, in looking at, at the, 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 the presentations is that, um, there's a number of things that was highlighted here is that the, in terms of your, the blockchain in terms of the crypto, uh, cryptocurrency or crypto asset, there is no bank. Uh, the money is being stored somewhere. And, 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 and in terms of, our, our, our communities and the interest that has been created by the companies and also the scams that is coming forward in terms of 
people losing a lot of money. So Chairperson, I think this matter is very serious because we need to look at it from a point of importance that because the point that was raised was the issues around the tax, the SARS and the regulatory, most important the risk of, 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 of how do we deal with this matter going forward and how do we protect our public and communities as government? Because as government, we have to play a role in terms of making sure that uh, 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 the, the, our people are protected so that the economy of the country is not being affected. So Chairperson, I want to make that point so that uh, going forward that we, 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 we have to move with speed and also to look at how do we inform our communities as government to bring our people on board to say that how do we engage with this matter? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I think that is my point. Is there anybody else in Kuleleko? No yes, Chairperson. Yeah, yes, my friend. Uh, Chair, <clears throat> I wanted to say that um, I also want to add my voice to welcome the presentation uh, by the presenters. And I really appreciate uh, that this being done. But I, my first question is why it has taken so long for this to be presented here, given the fact that as Comrade Njadu has indicated that we have known about this thing long time ago and it is in full swing, it is happening, trading is actually happening. That's my first question. The second question, in the countries that, in some of the countries that have been mentioned that this is happening already, it is even backed by the country assets, including uh, minerals, deposits, uh, oil deposits and so on. Uh, I just want to check from the South African point of view, is it backed by any assets as it is happening uh, right now? Number three, uh, the manner in which it is happening, I see that uh, it is using a duty-free kind of uh, processing. Why is this allowed, given the fact that we've got uh, uh, regulations that govern currencies? Why is it being treated as something that is operating in an ivory tower, uh, as if it is just happening in a space where we are a stateless uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, space? And then um, uh, my last question is that uh, we have a financial charter here, which deals with issues of transformation in terms of the participation, particularly of the previously disadvantaged people. Again, we will be found wanting here that this thing will be ahead of our masses of our people. Uh, was there any consideration that this thing could be plugged in within uh, such a regime? Uh, so basically, I want to understand the relationship between this and the fact that we even have a charter that addresses the issues of transformation. Are we gonna wait again until certain sections of our society are empowered and others are disadvantaged, and then we bring in transformation later. Is it not always better to preempt these things, given the fact that we're in a new dispensation, so that the manner in which new things that are coming into our economy must happen within the confines of the regimes that we have established to redress and, and, and address the issues of historical imbalances? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian, Brandon, we should give you some space to come in, but we'll come back to you. Uh, the first thing, the question you raised a lot about why we're doing it now, it's not a question you can put to PBO or NT. It's a question you're putting to the committee. Uh, ultimately, I'm held responsible for the committee, but obviously when we do quarterly program drafts, uh, members were free to raise it. We have put cryptocurrency as a pending item for the last, I think, quarter. Uh, we have actually had some exchange on cryptocurrency, maybe you weren't there, but with the Reserve Bank governor when he appeared before our committee about two years ago, in about 2017, 2018, I think we also had an input from uh, National Treasury and others, I can't recall who it was. Uh, so it's been there, but, uh, you know, we found a slot now. We were, in fact, expecting legislation to come to us from the NA side. 
And when the gap opened up, you will see in the first quarter program, we said these are, and when you said to the first drop in the second quarter, we said these are issues that we will try to slide in. So we had cryptocurrency there. But I, will, I think that this is our initial foray. It's a new term, five-year term. I think it's important we do it together with the NA committee to the extent it's possible. It was in fact raised with the chair there when I met with him in 2019, was it June or July, I can't recall. Uh, so it's been there on the agenda, but we found the slot now. Secondly, um, you know, I hear, uh, I can see the advantages of crypto uh, assets, right? Um, but you know, uh, when I, I'm honestly, I, I uh, you know, National Treasury speaks about, uh, you know, the volatility, highly volatile, you said, and inherently risky. Those are very powerful words. And then you spoke about scams and, you know, all of that. And, you know, on balance, given that you can do so many things without crypto assets, given how advanced uh, cell phone banking's become, um, I don't know what the advantages are of this, really. I like what you said, Dennis. It didn't strike me until you said it. But maybe people are doing it because it's not regulated. And maybe when it's regulated, they might do it less. I don't know. Maybe they'll do it more because now it's regulated. But it's also a way of avoiding SARS. I, I, I mean, the, the, some of the questions you and will you raised are exactly what I wanted to raise. You raised it in slightly different ways, but more or less it covered me on the tax issues, uh, Willie, also. Um, now, <clears throat> only one country have I got this right, sees it as an electronic currency. Am I correct? I'm surprised to hear that that is correct. I must tell you, I battle with blockchain. I mean, I, if I'm correct, now, can you help me here? Uh, blockchain is like, Somebody tried to explain it to me. I once went to this parliamentary network thing in Washington and they were flinging these words around and I was looking for somebody to explain it to me. And I thought I'll ring Momo uh, or, or somebody, Fuzila was around that time and asked them. And I never got to it, but I, I asked somebody there when I was at the meeting and they told me something like this. I got it right, uh, Treasury. It's, it's like, what is good about blockchain is that it's an open and transparent system of transactions and accounting. So let's say uh, you have people in Japan, in the United States, South Africa, Senegal, Ethiopia, and so on. They're all able to see the transactions and you're not able to like uh, fiddle them around like you can fiddle books or you can even fiddle uh, accounting uh, uh, books not physically like we used to do years ago, you can do it electronically. Like blockchain is good because it avoids uh, misdemeanors, wrongdoing, corruption, lack of transparency, and so on. That's what I understood it to be, that it's like a building block of things. So you can trace things back to the origins of the issue. And in between, uh, once something is put in, it's a building block sort of thing. And then you can't like alter what happened in the past. So you can it's more open and transparent. Am I correct that aspects of blockchain, it's far more complex than that, are what I understood that person to have told me about three, four years ago. So, you know, it's the same point Dennis makes that I, I raise, I mean, well, why, do we, why do people go for this? I can see some of his advantage. What's worrying me is he, he's saying pick and pay, which is where I do most of my shopping, right? He's allowing this now, I'm amazed actually. So. Soon checkers will be doing it and the spa will be doing it and so on. I would have understood if Woolies is doing it, but I mean, pick and pay. Well, that means things are moving. So obviously we have to regulate it. When the Reserve Bank governor came about two years ago, it was a meeting I can clearly remember in V Block. Um, it's above where the chief of office is, I think. I think that's where we had the, no, no, it was that one, yeah. Uh, he said that there's, regulations being planned and all that. And, uh, you know, I did think later when I'd spoken in Kulileko, maybe we should include the Reserve Bank in this discussion, but then it seemed to me three inputs would be too much for us. 
as it is two inputs have turned out to be a, a, a lot, but it's very valuable. Thank you to the two uh, institutes, uh, the, the two groups uh, making the input. Then, you know, um, I'm not absolutely clear how this can help poorer, more disadvantaged people. Uh, I can see how Time Bank and these new banks that are coming, right, uh, out, they have no bricks and mortar. Uh, I mean, I saw today, by the way, colleagues, in News 24, Capitec is like a huge number one brand name and so on. And it's a bank that is most favored by people from the lower income strata, okay? So, uh, uh, and they've gained a lot through COVID-19 uh, uh, challenges. So, you know, and I, and I see everywhere people are advertising Time Bank and so on. Now, we in the Standing Committee on Finance in the previous term had a massive, big financial sector transformation report done based on these hearings. And we said, you know, I don't know what you're going to say, who really owns the banks? It's not individuals. Uh, it's the pension funds. And who are the pension funds of? It's not mostly African and Black people more generally and others. And so on. I know all of that, right? But I'm saying, to the extent it's possible, as the ANC, we want to see some or other way, some or other measure beyond pension funds of African ownership of the financial sector, of banks and financial, other financial institutions, insurance companies. And at that stage, we thought the route might be, because it's so difficult to start a bank, especially when there's such high levels of monopoly. I know Treasury's view is that banks are invariably monopolistic, and it's, it's difficult to get in, and what about the poor people who will join a new bank and then lose all their money, et cetera. Oh, we know all of that. But nevertheless, we are saying that we would like to see African and Black ownership of the banks. And we thought at that stage, around 2017 or so, that now that we have these things like Time Bank, I'm not plugging Time Bank, there are others. Like there's that bank, a moment I heard about at this parliamentary network conference, 160 million <coughs> colleagues, 160 million clients in India, and they don't pay a penny. I don't know how that bank makes its profits, but you know, maybe Tracy can explain. Uh, that was 2017. I was stunned by that input. I don't know if you were there, Momo, but oh, I mean, the guy knocked me off my feet when I was sitting on a chair and almost fell off, metaphorically speaking. And I thought, wow, what about us? What about us? So, you know, I don't know how crypto assets are going to help the people who are in Capitec and who have only access to Imali or e-wallet or whatever it is to the cell phones, or who can only become clients of a bank like Time Bank. There are other issues here, but they overlap what I've said. I really have been stimulated a lot. Thank you very much. I want to think these things through. I wish we could meet again next Tuesday and follow these things. So I want to do a bit more reading, personally. It's very interesting. Thank you, guys. So shall we start with... Uh, Treasury, since most questions were put to you. <laughs> I, I share. I think Mr. Ryder has his hand up. As, okay. Yeah, Mr. Ryder. As long as you're not going to me now. Yeah. No, 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 no. It'll be very quick. And I apologize for coming back in. It's fine, uh, man. But... It's fine. Please, there's plenty of time. Please, I was teasing you. Ms. Ms. Matroni so answered so many questions you? that I crossed them all off and I crossed one off by mistake. And that just dealt with the scarcity factor where she spoke about the mining of these these coins um and you know i was wondering who controls that scarcity uh you know what's to say that 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 the the i don't know who, who who's the person at the center of the whole bitcoin thing you know what's to say he doesn't issue himself with two million bitcoins tomorrow uh and flood the market uh it's just something <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if there's an answer to that but it, it's something that bothers me thank you chair no, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's true. Okay. Shall we start with Tracy and then go to PBO? Um, yeah. Hola, you can start. Uh, okay. So I, I can go, Chair. So firstly, my role, I just wanted to clarify the issue of, of pick and pay. 
So what they did was they they did a test, a trial on using Bitcoin as a payment. However, they said that they are unlikely to roll out the solution until there's a clear regulatory framework in terms of how the the risks of crypto assets will be managed. So I just wanted to to clarify that point, Chair. But I'm going to ask uh, some of my colleagues that are on the line to come in. So for example, there's a colleague from SARS, Mr. Franz Tomasek, can answer the taxation uh, question, Chair. And then I can also take, there was a question that said, as South Africa, uh, where are we in terms of being restrictive, facilitative, or accommodative? So my reading of this is that what we are trying to do in the paper is that we are being facilitative. So we are being in the middle of being too restrictive because we are saying we want to allow the activity, but we allow responsible activity while we are protecting the consumer. Again, I indicated that we are being very, very cautious where, for example, we are saying that when it comes to retirement funds and collective investment schemes, we are saying that for now, until we have done proper research and we are sure of what we are doing, we will not be, be allowing exposure to these crypto assets. So from where I see it, our stance, it's a facilitative one. So we are neither too restrictive or too accommodative. I'll stop there, Chair, and ask my other colleagues to come in. Franz Tomasek can come in, uh, maybe Brendan Topham on what the FSCA is doing. Particularly, maybe uh, Brendan can share more what they did with that mirror. Uh, in, what is it called? The the MTI story that that scam. What the yeah FSCA. yeah that was in the media yeah. Yes yes. Franz, uh, so introduce that, yourself as you're coming here for the first time and be smart. Why you hide Miss Machane? We've never seen her before, and here she is. I don't know where you've been hiding her, but anyway, welcome to the committee. I don't think you've made a submission before us before. Have you met her? It's you because of the PFMA. <laughs> You're obsessed. Okay, Franz, introduce yourself. We don't know who the hell you are, please. Righty, Chair. For, for those who do not know who the hell I am, I'm teasing I am you, Franz Thomas Eck, and I look after legislative policy at SARS. Um, for those that do know who I am, hi, good to be back. Uh, so the question was, someone buys some crypto, sells some crypto a month later, what's the tax impact? So from an interpretive point of view, that looks awfully like a speculative transaction. So you bought and sold to make money. We consider that to be on revenue account, and that would be considered to be taxable in the normal course of your trade, essentially, or your speculation in, in cryptocurrency or crypto assets. I think the deeper underlying question is, well, how would SARS detect that? And so, first of all, remember, SARS depends to a very large extent, and it's part of our strategic objectives to encourage voluntary compliance. So people should be declaring this in and of themselves. But the question then is, what happens if this person who got the 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 doesn't do that? Well, in this particular example, the person now has five, fifty, or five hundred thousand rand that they didn't have before. And SARS would see that in their bank account and would say, well, that's very interesting. Where did that come from? And so the string would be there for us to pull on to unravel the transaction. Um, the, the concept, the point has been made that, that crypto is often uh, looked at because of its anonymity. And that really does depend on the nature of the crypto asset where we're looking at. Some are more strongly anonymous than others. Uh, but for certainly for several of the more popular ones, uh, they're not quite as anonymous as people may think. And if you're interested, uh, drop the search term Bitcoin Silk Road seizure into Google and have a look at what happened uh, to some Bitcoins that were used in an illegal underground economy known as Silk Road, which was closed down by the US authorities. And it took them something like seven years to, to track the, the money down, but track it down they did. And they were able to seize it and then sell it. So as I said, anon anonymity is variable. And if there are sufficient reasons to uh, try and work out who lies behind a particular blockchain account uh, or account on the blockchain, which, as has been mentioned, is public knowledge, 
Uh, there are techniques for unraveling that. But more realistically, for smaller amounts, uh, the normal SARS investigative tools would probably be very effective in picking up that there were undeclared transactions. Are you done? I'm, okay. I'm done, Chair. Okay, Brandon? Honorable Chair, good afternoon to you and um, to all the other members. It's good to be back. And I'm glad to see that nothing has changed in this committee, even though it's a different <laughs> committee. It's the same, and I'm glad to see everything's still the same. Um, Hi, Brandon. How's it, everyone? <laughs> Just a quick, uh, quick few points. I think the members must remember the Financial Sector Regulation Act, which was written by this committee. And um, there's a lot of cooperation that happens between uh, the, the Treasury stable. So I can assure you that when we come across information, about revenue transactions, we, we feed it across to the, the revenue authorities and vice versa, as well as to the exchange control department. So we've been watching crypto assets very, very carefully. And um, there's a lot of people that are in for a couple of surprises from, from a few bodies. So if, if one of us don't get you, the other one will, will definitely get you. Um, and in case anybody's in any doubt, we do not like crypto assets. Uh, we accept that it's yeah, but we're obviously all very skeptical of it. Uh, we don't like it, but we realize there was 2.9 trillion US dollars and let's say 55 million accounts worldwide. This is going very fast and we cannot play ostrich with it. We cannot ignore it. Um, and so that's why the approach of the FECA has, has been to push the, the idea of regulating the people that are in the middle, the exchanges. And as um, Honorable Najada very correctly pointed out, you're not dealing with the bank, but effectively, in many cases, you are dealing with something like a bank. You're giving your money to these exchanges and hoping that they will honor this commitment. So a lot of South Africans are giving their money at the moment to, to companies. I um, was on a call right now before we came into this, an international call, and they're all complaining about Cyprus at the moment. You're giving the money to com companies in Cyprus, and the money just disappears. So one of the ways we want to protect the users, because our constitution allows you to throw your money away if you want to throw your money away. If you want to gamble it, you're allowed to gamble it. But in our case, we're saying that if you're going to do this, at least use a South African registered financial service provider um, who will be registered with us and who will therefore also help ensure that this anon anonymity falls away. So even though we can trace where money flows through the, uh, through the blockchain, we don't always know who it is. But if you open up your wallet in South Africa, there will be a requirement with, this, with the FIC regulation changes that are coming across that they need to know who that money belongs. So it will make it easier for law enforcement to be able to track money that is based in South Africa at one point in time. Of course, when the money hits a Cyprus account, it's gone and we, we really can track it easily. Although I see Peter Smith's on the call from the FIC, and I know they've got quite a sophisticated intelligence database so that they sometimes know where it is although it's intelligence that so can't always be used uh, by us, but it does help to know where the money is going to. But just Mike, a few cents worth on how it helps lower income people. As you know, we're all very worried about inclusion, inclusion to get people in South Africa into the financial system. Um, but in, and, and we're doing quite a good job and our banks, I think have access and are, are, and are accessible to the lower income people. But in certain countries in Africa, for instance, it's a lot worse than here. And in those countries, they're finding that crypto uh, payments can be uh, uh, useful to get it to the lower income uh, persons. But in South Africa, I think our banks are able to fill this inclusion need with a, with a little bit of a, assistance, which they are getting from the PA and, and, and Treasury at the moment. So, uh, and I think Henko from the SAB will probably better uh, testify to this. At the moment, it takes, I think, 15 minutes for a transaction on the, on, the, on the crypto wallet to be properly approved if you use it as a payment mechanism at a cashier or something. And that's why I probably won't be able to fill that role in South Africa. Um, the other uh, problem with crypto is that of the 2.9 trillion US dollar payments last year, just 0.34% was illicit. Um, well, that's the, the calculations. So the majority of people that are currently using crypto or the man in the street. And it says hype as the PBO referred to it. I like the word hype. I always call it the perception. Um, this, this noise is what's driving up the prices. So whilst crypto assets are by themselves, 
not bad. The underlying different crypto assets, some of them um, are dangerous for consumers. And, and by, by, reg, by us regulating the, the, the middleman, making sure that the, the advice given is proper and that the people that, that the South African citizens are dealing with are legitimate, um, the chances that they will lose their money from the exchange risk is much lower. The chances that they, in my opinion, are going to, to lose their money when, when some of these crypto assets collapse, that's, that, that we can't protect them from. And the only way we can do that is, as we've done, uh, we've got, given general warnings to the public. And whenever we speak on television or radio, we tell people, this is a high risk investment. It's, if you're going to speculate, because I don't like to use investment and crypto in the same sentence, then please make sure it's a very small percentage of your uh, retirement savings. I'll leave it at that, um, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, next round of questions that you have to answer is, why can't you find us some better DA members to serve in this parliament like yourself? But don't answer right now, thank you. Next round, after 7 p.m. tonight. Next, that was a facetious remark, Dennis, before you take me to court. Right, so uh, who's next, uh, Treasury? Uh, Tim, why don't you come in from the south? Okay. okay. Thanks, Chair and uh, members of the committee. Thanks, Momo, for the opportunity. <clears throat> I'll just touch on a few things related to the questions that have been posed. Uh, Tim, can, you Tim, right? can, can, can you put your video on? Because the uh, Parliament's uh, uh, broadcasting people, they prefer that unless it's out. Oh, okay, right. there you are. No. Thank you. Eh? Sorry for that. I thought uh, it was on. Hopefully it doesn't go off. No problem. Thank I don't care, but you know, I have to abide by the rules here. Yes. Th thanks, Chair. I think the first thing I'll just uh, add on what colleagues have already said on the call and starting with what is this solving for, at least as it relates to payments? What is broken in the current system that this is trying to solve for? And my attempt would be that. Uh, from what we hear, the only reason that is making sense is that when I, be, I pay in cash, I'm with a merchant or somebody I'm buying a product or services from. I hand over the cash, I take the goods or I receive the service and the deal is done. But the current payment system has got intermediaries. Either I say I transfer money from my account at my bank to the seller or the provider of the services account at a bank. Then it means there's a third party in the equation because it's me wanting to pay you and there's somebody that has to facilitate the move of the funds. Or if we are at different banks, then it is the money moving from one bank at the reserve bank to the account of the other bank and moving to the other party. So what is said to us with this crypto assets when they use for payments is that it will get rid of the intermediaries. That is money will move as though I'm handing over cash in my hand to the, someone else's hands, no one involved. And that's where this blockchain distributed ledger technology comes in because then I hand over that cash through a distributed ledger that is held at several places. And there's this consensus of the block that is added to the chain, which is the technical part that the chair indicated that when try, trying to explain it is complex. But now it means it's the two people just using the systems, no other parties involved. That's why it is said to be different from the current system. But by being different from the current system, to us, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more efficient. Unless we say with the current system, there's other parties and they eat the fees and with the system, maybe it will be cheap. So I was just trying to pack this one of saying, why do we need this while we have systems that work currently? Now, then into this equation comes what the Reserve Bank has launched in terms of a central bank issued digital currency 
where the Reserve Bank has launched a project to test the feasibility of us issuing a central bank digital currency that will do exactly that in order for this to be issued by a central bank, which is trusted and which has got controls rather than it being issued by the private sector. But the thought is not to ban the private sector, but is to fulfill the need that is out there. So that's where the CBDC project of the Reserve Bank comes in. If that proves to work and the feasibility is proven, it is possible that the Reserve Bank may decide to issue a central bank issued digital currency, which will fulfill this role. Now, from the private sector perspective, we view this that most of the currencies that are out there are not necessarily trying to solve the payment use case. They're trying to do investment, people getting money overnight and other issues. So the payment use case is not overly pronounced, but we recognize that it could be there and thus we should do something about it so that we offer the transacting public the facilities for them to be able to transact. And thus the project COCA that uh, uh, all out spoke about that the Reserve Bank we ran Project Coca One was successful. We are going into Project Coca Two to test at the central bank how we can enable payments to leverage this newer technologies, as it is said, peer to peer payment without anybody in between and facilitating efficient payments. Now, in that quest. We asked as the Reserve Bank, well, our executive took a decision, and this is a question that is confronting everybody around the world, to say, do you want to be the leader of the world and break ground so that everybody learns from you? Or do you want to be a fast follower such that you observe these things closely and you move with speed to embrace the benefits of this technology? Or do you just become a follower and you'll come later? From where we stand, and many, many jurisdictions don't prefer to be the, the leader because they will bend their fingers for everybody to learn. And we have gravitated to say, we'll be a fast follower. We are observing this very closely and we will ensure that we move with the agility that is required rather than being the leaders or being the followers that are behind. Now, the position that we have taken in terms of what we need to do from a policy stance in terms of crypto assets, at least from a payment use case, is that there's two areas of worry for us, that there's a number of monetary policy implications that we still need to understand better before we can embrace this. Secondly, there could be financial stability risks that we don't understand well, and we need to understand them. So the position that has been uh, acceded to by the executive in the sub is that we should do this inviting the private sector that are issuing these offerings, the crypto assets, go with them into a control environment that is normally called the sandbox. We allow them to test this with the regulators for us to understand some of these things that we don't understand better so that if we embrace that, we have a good understanding. So we have opted to invite a number of the issuers of the crypto assets to go into a sandbox or a controlled environment with us as the regulators so that we can deal with these products from a payment perspective and try to resolve some of their unknowns. And if we do get the other side and we see the benefits overweighing the risks and we have things under control, it is possible that we would then adopt a robust regulatory stance to be able to embrace them. I think uh, Momo and my colleagues from the Treasury, that's uh, in short what I thought I could add at this stage. Thanks, Tim. That's actually very helpful. You explained it nice and simply. Thanks for us. And thanks to you. Uh, we appreciate that. Next, Momo, please. Um. Well, Brendan spoken. Is there anyone else in the team here? Fincer? Or Peter? From FIC? Peter's here from the FIC. Shouldn't he say something? Yeah, Peter? 
thank you, Mama. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I, I think just very quickly from the FIC's point of view to confirm, as uh, Brandon had said earlier, um, and, and Ms. Mchani has indicated in the presentation, um, there are definite plans uh, underway to uh, bring the service providers, those intermediaries uh, that, that Brandon had, talk, uh, had spoken about, um, that allow people or enable people to acquire crypto assets, uh, bring them into the net under the FIC Act, um, and uh, require them to comply with the same types of uh, uh, obligations and requirements that financial institutions have to comply with. Uh, so but for all intents and purposes, uh, from an anti-money laundering or anti-terror financing point of view, we will uh, be treating those service providers as if they are providing a financial service, in the, even though we don't necessarily consider it the, 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 the asset that they deal with uh, to, to be funds or money, in, as, as uh, Ms. Chani had explained. Um, the, the net effect of what they do is equivalent to the types of services that financial institutions provide, and therefore we, we believe there should be an equal playing field and they should be subject to the same type of uh, uh, regulation. Um, just also the point that uh, Franz Thomas had made from SARS, um, and what we have found from the FIC's point of view is if one uh, is able to subject those service providers to the type of uh, requirements to identify customers, to keep track of uh, customers' uh, information, uh, understand their customers' business uh, in the same way that a bank needs to do. Um, the blockchain, the, the underlying technology that allows crypto asset uh, transactions actually becomes uh, one of our most powerful weapons uh, in, in tracing and, uh, uh, individuals that are involved in transactions. Um, because as, as Thomas had explained, uh, the, the uh, blockchain is a, is a massive bookkeeping system that keeps track of each and every transaction in a uh, crypto asset or in a particular crypto asset that uh, is, is uh, um, traded on the basis of a particular blockchain. Um, so if one can tie the identity of the persons uh, to the transaction information that sits in that ledger, it actually tells you the whole story of how the asset moves and who is involved in, in every step of the, the, the transaction chain. So that, that's sort of the, the objective that we're working towards uh, with, with uh, the proposals to bring uh, the, this, those service providers into the, um, the, the same uh, uh, set of regulations that currently apply to, um, to financial institutions from an FIC Act point of view. Um, I'd be happy to explain further and, and, and provide some uh, more information if, if members are interested. But we, we've had fairly good successes in the FIC over the past, and there's some of it has been reported in our last annual report, for instance, uh, where we were able to, to trace transactions, identify persons, and actually um, launch uh, successful um, forfeiture um, uh, uh, proceedings through the asset forfeiture unit uh, where, where crypto assets were used in, in uh, illegal schemes. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Thank you. Uh, can we hand over to PB or Momo, unless you want to say something quickly? Yeah, Chair, I mean, I think there's not much more to say, but I guess I just wanted to make two broad points. I mean, I think the critical aspect for us is that this is a financial, well, this is a product that's been sold as a financial service. And obviously, Fisca is developing its capacity. The issue is that we need to regulate it. Too many people are buying it. Um, and frankly, even if one person just bought it, we, ne we need to have it regulated. And I think, uh, you know, just given that Fisca has been new as well, um, I think um, I would have preferred we had, had done this sooner, but you are dealing with the unknown. So this is a difficult area. I also think that there's quite an element of forbidden fruit that the state doesn't know. So people like the anonymity and so on. Um, so, you know, we, we should just be mindful of that as well. It's not something that we should encourage in any way. I think another aspect that hasn't come, Chair, is Bitcoin and that um, requires a, a very high level of uh, uh, electricity use. I think Domasani did deal with it. So if you saw even Elon Musk recently when he, when he supported, he said you can pay in Bitcoin. He quickly reversed when he realized that he wouldn't have very green credentials. 
if he's going to to um, support this currency. So he took a he reversed his view in a matter of a day or two. But thank you, Chair. So there's a lot of elements I'm just saying that, uh, around it that needs to be looked at. And it's not like we have all the answers. I think we're also learning and hopefully getting our, you know, j j just beginning to understand how to regulate it more effectively and protect people from uh, big potential abuses. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, the more I think about it, colleagues, this is such a big issue and it's such a difficult area to navigate that we can't just have a hearing, a uh, briefing here in the NCOP. There should be a broader discussion with uh, several committees affected, both NA and NCOP at some stage. Going. All right, over to you, Dumasani and your team. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and all members for, for the comments. I think uh, talking to the point of why as a need for, for this, if, if the system, I think the, the cryptocurrency, crypto assets, you know, it's, you know, it's seen really as, as one of the things, as an innovation that came from the financial technology, you know, for, you know and, and I think uh, when you listen to, when, when you look at our slides, on our slides, the, the last two slides, we're showing that, um, you know, some of the countries recognize, the, you know, the innovation or whatever you want to call it, uh, to extend of, saying they probably need to develop the, their own uh, backed central bank or, or government backed cryptocurrency as as tim was saying you know i didn't it, it, it does identify certainly an area in the market that has not been <coughs> that has not been um <coughs> sorry about that that's not been um fulfilled <coughs> um sorry uh, sorry chairperson uh so so there is certainly you know seen as, 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 as areas of, 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 of um, you know, I mean, the issue around, you know, when I, when I said, when I when look at when uh, the, the, the Bitcoin particularly when it started, obviously there has been the issue around, um, you, know, you know, how is the system more inclusive or how is the system more, uh, you know, allowing innovative, but I think the, 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 the issue of protection uh, of the, the society comes in as, as a big, big point, as, as colleagues have been raising from Malaysia Tiger. Um, but what we also highlighted, Chairperson, in, in the last slide of presentations around the, what the team has been saying, the implications of the, uh, the economy as a whole and, and regulatory, um, you know, you know, microeconomic implications and also the monetary policy implications in the, in the regulation becomes important. Um, of course, many countries, um, as the countries are not seeing this as a currency, and it, is, it's, it doesn't pose, impose uh, risks into the into the financial system. But there are elements where you you recognize that this becomes more mainstream, more used by institutional investors. Um, it raises certainly the, the concerns in terms of how do you make sure that you allow innovation to take place. But at the same time, it's within the boundaries where. Uh, the system is not compromised and, and many people um, are able to benefit in the system. Which boils me back to a point raised around slide nine or about the myths um, and, 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 and you know, related to the cryptocurrency or crypto assets, when you call it. Um, I mean, that's precisely the point that, you know, many people are playing to space without really uh, much understanding how the system works, as technical it is. Um, Okay, I think my okay. As as I don't know if you can hear me, Chairperson, because I hear somebody. Uh, I see a note. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you from my side. Right. Yes, I mean the, the issue around the points on the myth is to address uh, the issue of, of information um, availability to understand. I think uh, this may be, and it's a moving uh, thing. Uh, because the, 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 the easy element of trying to move away from the real-time environment or just trying to uh, you know, generate the hypes and so on. I think the, the, the issue of the myth, um, you know, as, you know, as you noted there, Honorable uh, Moletani, um, I mean, the, 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 the cryptocurrencies are only good for, for criminal. Certainly, it has been used for criminal activities when you listen to, uh, uh, you know, many countries. I, I would have cited the, the EU paper there where they worried about the, the financial crimes and so on, but certainly, as colleagues have been saying, uh, from treasury, it has been used for other reasons other than 
which could be regarded as uh, investments, uh, whether regulated or not, yes, they have been used there. Um, and and uh, blockchain does allow issue of, uh, uh, of being able to understand who, who are the players, um, which means that there is not necessarily mean there's anonymity. But of course, it's, it's an issue of how you go about, you know, tap into it to the pick up or to understand who are the actual players within the system and which I suppose the regulator and firm try to address that point. So I think the issues of, of the myth is really to say there's certainly need for more information in a very accessible language in layman's terms, but also broadly to explain to the society to community how does that affect the entire system and how it works. Jefferson, I think most of the questions were answered. I'll just stop there. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. Mr. Simulani, do you want to say anything? No, you won't say anything. It's fine. Thanks. Sir. Okay. Siraj, do you want to say something? No, Siraj won't say anything. Sorry, Chairman. Siraj is actually, he won't be saying anything. Thank you. Okay, well, there's something you said there. Can members please note that? Then Brandon? Brandon's got his hand up. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, there was one question uh, regarding the scarcity that I was answered that if you like, I can attempt to answer it. Uh, because every single crypto asset, remember, there's thousands of crypto assets that have different rules. Bitcoin has programmed into its calculation at this point in time, a maximum of 21 million crypto coins can be uh, created. Uh, and I think in Ethereum, which is the second largest, they've got an 80 million limit per year at, at this stage. Um, and, and this is the argument which people raise as to why Bitcoin, for instance, goes up in value because of the scarcity issue. Um, but I mean, a month ago, Bitcoin was worth 820,000. Today's worth 520,000 rand. And if you take that first uh, pizza that was bought for 8 billion rand using the high, uh, I can't justify in my mind how that scarcity as a utility method can move a price up in a few years from from that a pizza would cost you eight billion back then in current in current valuation of a bitcoin so the scarcity argument which is put forward by by users of crypto assets must be taken with a, i think a, a pinch of salt and specifically as the majority of users around the world aren't using crypto as a payment mechanism they're using it at this point in time as a speculation and as a store of wealth and, and that's the danger when I mean, people are storing wealth yeah. it doesn't exist Okay, colleagues, if you look at the chat group, uh, Siraj has put in two major uh, inputs. I'll quickly read it to you because he's having a microphone problem, right? He says, first, I have a few points I'm concerned that the extent of the macroeconomic implications of cryptocurrencies have not been adequately explored. Government's focus is too much. Uh, as a financial services issue, not a monetary systems issue. Okay, there should be a government research project led by the NT and Saab on the macroeconomic implications of increasing use of crypto assets, including the functioning of the monetary system, efficiency of monetary policy, the impact on banking and finance markets, including financial stability. The importance of macroeconomic policy for supporting South Africa's economic development and inclusive growth should be central to such a study. So. Who went from Treasury wants to reply to that? He then goes on to say, uh, oh, there's a second one here. Uh, it's becoming more widespread and mainstream crypto increases as it becomes. A crypto increases systemic financial risk because of the volatility and difficulty in valuing it, and also related to the delays within the system of trading and covering it into the sovereign or other currencies. The same issues that were problems for the financial assets used during the subprime bubble, that's interesting, and led to the crash can apply to cryptocurrencies, really, as they're being used now for speculative purposes and being used more by institutional investors and exchange-traded funds. The crypto is being used as collateral that increases leverage of these institutions. Then there's Dennis saying, it's a giant Ponzi scheme, question mark, investment bubble. Look, I mean, what these guys are now saying there, both of them, is something that, uh, you know, you've all been saying in different ways, I suppose, but put down in those harsh, well, direct words, 
it hits you a bit more. It hits me anyway. It's a subjective response. Uh, Treasury, do you want to say anything in reply to the comments from Suraj and from uh, from from what's his name, Dennis? Anybody from Treasury? Yeah, Cheno, I, I think like you say, you know, we've been saying there's a lot of risks around this and depending on the volume. I mean, obviously the volume scales up, it becomes a macro risk. So it, it's just how the growth of this can be a future risk. But I think what's been said even by, by Tim, um, uh, that in, in, in many instances, you know, some countries are going to accept th this medium. Um, some and and at some point, uh, it, it's it's better to regulate it than to uh, just leave it unregulated because people do find a way to trade. So you know, I think we share the the potential risks. They can be very significant, but on the other hand, we can't cut ourselves off from it. <laughs> I, the, the the hard point is, you know, what's the right balance? How do you mm -hmm. do all of that? So, so Chair, I mean, I guess this is just, you know, continuing work. And and I guess I know members have asked, you know, we should get involved and so on. I, I think that for the moment, the regulators really need to come up with a, a, a coherent framework, which is what we're trying to do with discussion papers. Um, yes, time is not on our side. Um, but that's probably the way to go. It would be easier then to engage even in Parliament once we have uh, clear proposals and uh, are mindful of, of, of the risks. Um, yeah. No, I understand you, Momo. You know, uh, the committee has raised this, the previous committee, uh, you might have forgotten, we've not have been there a few times. Um, and at that stage, the Saab and others were saying yourselves, uh, that you're working on some regulatory framework. Now it's three, four years later. Maybe, look, I may have it wrong, Momo and others, but with COVID-19 and people getting desperate and, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, you're functioning from your homes often and using more internet than you've ever done. On the other hand, you know, you're losing money and you want to find ways of making easy money and others are vulnerable, <clears throat> and so they can be, uh, you know, exploited and all. For all those reasons, uh, I think Momo, uh, from my side at least, it seems to me one needs to escalate the preparations on papers. And at that stage, the Reserve Bank said they're preparing a draft paper and so on. And some of it's, I know, through the public domain out there. But I think you need to move with a bit of speed. I was very interested, Momo, at your point about Elon Musk retreating within 24 hours. I didn't realize that uh, uh, tra uh, transacting requires so much of electricity, uh, if that's what you were saying. Uh, finally, uh, I, I think members may suggest that we're about to draw to a close. I have another meeting at five. Alex, the meeting started at four, but I have to join him at five. Uh, but I think for now, it's an initial foray I remain of the view that where possible, if it's possible, we should work with the NA committee and others to take this thing forward. But Momo, we'll wait on Treasury and the other institutions, Saab and so on, to get your act together. As you're saying, we do it prematurely, then, uh, you know, it's not much value. If we have something that's there as a draft, obviously we can even have a hearing of some sort so that we in the parliament can hear other points of view apart from yours and PBOs and the state institutions that are relevant, like FIC and so on and so on, right, and FSCA and so on. Maybe we want to hear academics and others, NGOs on this matter. It's a very interesting matter. It's a very necessary matter to look at. But I think as a parliament, we need to hear a wider range of stakeholders and experts, so to speak, in this area. That's my suggestion. If that's okay, can we draw to a close? Uh, Suraj, once again, is there. What's he saying? He sent us a reference uh, from the internet, I think, if I'm correct. Can people please look at that? That's easy to do. You can read it yourself. I wanted a response from Treasury, uh, which is why I read out what Suraj said. But the rest of it is, uh, uh, oh, Ms. Machali has left. 
Okay, but Mr. Momoni answers yes. She says, excellent interaction, says Dennis. I presume he said this after I spoke. Further interaction, possibly more suited to the NA than to us, but we must be informed. Today was needed and greatly appreciated. Okay, Dennis, thanks for your kind words to Treasury and PBO. Uh, now, before we part, just a quick one, sincere. Can somebody tell me quickly, this term Bitcoin, where does it come from? Why is it Bitcoin, not eCoin or, or some other thing, Sitcoin? Why is it Bitcoin? Uh, the blockchain I can understand. It, it, the word seems to suggest what it is once you get to know, to the extent I have, what it is. But why is it Bitcoin? And why is it crypto? Dennis is Chair, a though, brand. Look, I'm not, I, I ain't no expert on this, but cryptocurrency describe or crypto assets describe the entire phenomenon. Uh, uh, your why is it crypto? Not, uh, uh, maybe let the others comment. And Bitcoin is just the name of the company that. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dennis said so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Presumably, Dennis has been trying his luck some because he knows a lot more than us. I'm just oh, teasing oh, you, Dennis. Yeah, yeah who's Jay, that? I, I, why is it crypto, I, my friend? Tim, yeah, Tim, why is it crypto? Yes, why I is think Bitcoin, Bitcoin, you know. Yeah, I think uh, the Bitcoin, I may speculate because of bits and bytes in a machine, but crypto ah, it comes yes. from crypto comes from cryptography, which is the, yes. the uh, I don't know whether members know about the exchange of keys so that uh, if I put something in the vault, I, I sign the door with my private key and I keep, give you a public key for you to be able to open. So crypto yeah. comes from cryptography, which is the yeah. phenomenon that safeguards that uh, distributed ledger in a in a blockchain environment. So crypto comes from that. All right, right. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, any more in the chat group? Let's see what people are saying. Uh, Brandon has given us a reference, I think, to check it out. Although it's Wikipedia, Brandon. People often say we should be cautious, but nevertheless, we can look it up. Uh, okay, okay. I don't see anybody else who's had that. So can now, I tell you a yeah. funny story quickly? Please do. You've got there was eight a case minutes, of yes. someone who had lots of money and then he died and yes. they just couldn't find this key. And of course, the key is a code. So yes. I know the family and everyone was trying to get the money. I don't know what happened after, but it, for more than a year, they couldn't get the money. So when it disappears, it also disappears in the. In the in the iCloud or wherever in the either. So there's all kinds of lists. <laughs> you know Maybe how much your money was suspected of that story. Momo, do you know how much your money is suspected to have disappeared there? No, the guy was uh, had a few million. There's okay, a lot so of money in the US, not, not, in a, no, money? No, not here. Yeah, but what happens to it? It just like is there in outer space. Or in the cyber world, is that, that what it is? The money just yeah. stays. Let the experts come in and talk. I'm not. Well, what would happen, Tim or whoever? Brandon, what would happen? Tim, Reserve Bank, you should know what happens to the money. I, I thought if it's a world that uh, perhaps <laughs> had an intermediary <laughs> in between, there yeah. would be a a, a, a safety exit for somebody to have a master key to come and open. But that is a very tricky question because in mm. this cryptography, it is said that if I sign or I write something, I write it with my private key and only me knows the private key. Mm. I only give you the public key to read, not to write. So I would guess that uh, with a master key of some controller somewhere, we could be able to unlock this. Otherwise, we'll ask the miners to come and crack it, and maybe they will uh, be able to get there. Yeah, so that family loses on. Of course, you can always tell your children that you left some money in this crypto uh, assets sphere, and then you haven't, and then you don't give them the access code or whatever the word is, and there isn't the money there, but they think there is the money there, and they never find it. <laughs> okay, we can have all sorts of, uh, side, side stories flowing from that. But having said that, thank you very much. Anybody else? We've got a few minutes left, but we don't want to use the six minutes unless we have to. Yeah, we got a Herco Stain who wants to say something. Yes, Mr. Stain. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. So I'm Marcus Stein from the South African Reserve Bank, focusing on oh, uh, right. our work on, on crypto assets. So I can, I can very briefly uh, and, and gladly comment on um, the financial stability and monetary policy considerations from the SOAR perspective, um, and maybe just on, on the, the some of the other questions that have been doing the rounds. So I think the Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is broken up into 100 million Satoshis, uh, named after the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, so I think it just speaks to the divisibility of a Bitcoin. Um, then um, I think maybe just on... The, some of the other questions around um, some of the wallets that have been um, kind of in, inaccessible. Um, there are quite a few such uh, accounts where, where people um, realize they actually had some Bitcoin stored on an old computer that they threw out. Um, there's a quite a well-reported case of one of the uh, uh, CEO of one of the large international crypto asset yes, trading Yeah, I did that. Yeah, in FT or something. Yes, yes. yes yeah. um, and, and that person actually died, and that person was the only person who had um, kind of the, the private keys to unlock the omnibus account for all the crypto assets the exchange held on clients' behalf. Um, so, so maybe just on, on kind of the, uh, the possibility of the, the miners um, kind of coming to the rescue, that's um, if you look at the, the kind of private key that enables um, the, the spending of a value in a cryptocurrency wallet, um, it, it consists of um, around 50 alphanumeric upper and lowercase um, kind of characters, um, and the the possible or the chances of kind of guessing or, or cracking that is um, almost uh, apparently the the chances are bigger of winning the lotto. Um, I think around six times uh, in a row. Um, so, so it's it's really very difficult. So, so kind of Ooh. ongoing technological developments such as uh, quantum computing might change that over time. But for now, it's it's essentially if you lose the private keys, that's that's gone forever, and you don't have any recourse. Um, maybe just very briefly on the financial stability and monetary policy implications. Um, so I think that that is something that from the Reserve Bank's perspective, we can we we monitor very closely as it directly um, kind of has potential implications. For the SARP mandate around price and financial stability, uh, if you look at the two largest crypto assets by value and market capitalization, so that would be crypt, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and through mining activity, um, currently around $100 million worth of value is created through crypto asset mining just of those two assets on a daily basis. Uh, if you extrapolate that over the course of a year, uh, it means uh, probably around $120 billion worth of value is created through crypto asset mining of Bitcoin and Ethereum. That excludes the, the other more than 10,000 crypto assets out there. Um, so I think in terms of the broader um, kind of, if, if we look at the kind of the broad definition of money in existence, probably sitting um, around in excess of $100 uh, trillion uh, at the moment, so um, an annual addition to that in the in the uh, region of 120 billion dollars uh, is not systemic um, at this stage. Uh, crypto asset mining not um, kind of widespread in South Africa, uh, generally due to the the price of electricity, and it's simply not economically viable. Um, and then also in terms of monetary policy implications, um, for, for now it is definitely something that we continue to monitor. Um, but for for the time being. Um, Again, due to the value being created uh, through or outside of the traditional financial and banking system, um, it is not of immediate concern, but definitely uh, an area that we do keep monitoring. Um, and then also just uh, on the financial stability implications and fully noting that we're basically out of time. Um, so the Financial Stability Board, the assessment continues to be, even with the recent increase in price and value, uh, the current um, market capitalization or total value of all the crypto assets in existence uh, today currently sits at around one and a half uh, trillion dollars. Um, so again, uh, not systemic uh, at the moment, but again, given the fast moving nature and should there be continued kind of uh, uptake as we've observed over the last few years, that assessment may change over time. But let me stop there and thanks so much, Jay. All right, so we're about to finish. Thank you for that. Uh... Uh, you speak even faster than me. I didn't think I'll come across somebody who does. But that's been very helpful too, my friend. Thank you for that. So uh, uh, I end on the note that I congratulate the chairperson for ending one minute earlier than time. It's 1850, uh, 1659.
And I thank everybody for that, mostly the chairperson for finishing uh, uh, 60 seconds ahead of time. Thank you. Look, finally, on a more serious note, I do regret uh, Dubasani Momo. I do regret and your teams that this input hasn't been exposed to a wider audience, really. So many of us could learn so much from this input, whichever committee we're in, even if it's not in the economic stroke financial cluster of committees. But thank you for that. Uh, it's been very, very stimulating and very interesting. Thank you uh, to all the inputs, inputters, if there's such a word. Uh, thank you indeed to the members. Uh, we shall see you tomorrow in the Appropriations Committee. Thank you. Bye then. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chairperson members. Bye.